Hi everyone. Good to see you on my channel today. Today I will tell you a wonderful story. It is full of love and kindness. I hope you enjoy it and I wish you an enjoyable viewing experience. Thank you. Alexander was an adventurer by nature. He was always looking for adventures on his heel, and as a rule, he found it. At least, that was the case in the last years of his life. But now, when all his dreams had crumbled to dust, all he wanted was peace. To escape, to leave, to dissolve, and he had to do it in proud solitude. Alexander pressed the gas, sitting in his car, and every now and then a stingy tear ran down his cheek. Such a talented surgeon, his former father-in-law, said to him reproachfully, and such a talentless entrepreneur. That's why you went into business, huh? Well, if you don't know how to do it, don't take it. The truth is that Alexander did not think so. In his mind, he really knew how to do everything and much better than others. He calculated everything up to the last minute, envisioned everything, took everything into account. He ordered a brand book, did the planning, auditing, and generally did everything to avoid mistakes, calculated the potential profit, laid out funds for unforeseen expenses, and it still burned so bad you could see the smoke billowing from New York City. The entire medical community was discussing a massive failure. His project with the beautiful name Clinic Zero didn't just fail to take off. It collapsed, and the vibrations of the fall traveled through the yellow press, corrupt telegram channels, public pages on social networks. Expensive equipment, medicines, huge advertising costs all went to waste. And most importantly, his honest name was completely devalued. Not only his business, but his family as well. Ketenka had always been susceptible to public opinion. So she grabbed their daughter and hid in her father's mansion. Alexander was not even allowed on the threshold, and his former father-in-law spoke to him through the video intercom. What have I done? Asked the surgeon, gesticulating vigorously. It's not my fault that things didn't go according to plan. Or rather, it's not all my fault. Who else but you? Go away, or I'll call the police, my father-in-law said. And you know I have good connections there. Bankruptcy is not the end of the world, continued the surgeon. I can do anything. My family will not starve. Get out. The voice was adamant. Get Catherine, Alexander demanded. Let her tell me everything herself. Do you really think my daughter wants to talk to a washed up man like you? The man scoffed. Go away and forget her. The lawyer will send you the divorce papers and you'll sign them. What about the child? Alexander asked. Do you want to separate me and Casey? But the intercom was silent, the interlocutor disconnected. From the other side of the massive fence sounded the footsteps of the guard, and the surgeon considered it best to leave. He was afraid not of the police, but of other people. After all, the father-in-law, like a master gangster, could account for every million except for the first. There were different rumors, but Alexander did not want to check them, or he didn't want to check them yet. Now all he had to do was run to find a quiet place where he could lick his wounds like a beaten dog. Good thing at least some of his possessions had been saved. Mercedes Vito, for instance. A great car, high seating position, smooth running, huge interior. It's what Alexander used to get out of Washington. He had to hide out and wait out the troubled times. Wait for the creditors to cool off so he could negotiate and settle the debt or maybe start a new case. I didn't lose, Alexander said out loud. No, you didn't. I bought experience. I just don't like to bargain, and I don't know how to bargain. The price of buying experience was very upsetting. His whole epic with the clinic generated a giant minus of $100,000. From his comrades, he knew that in the 90s, for a much smaller amount could be taken out into the woods, tied to a tree or kept in the basement. Back then, proud investors did not forgive debts and tried their best to pay them back. Of course, the times in the US are not the same anymore. 
but they will definitely want to get at least part of that money from him, especially since all the contracts bear his signature. What Alexander could not understand to the end why he lost. Alas, to figure it out was not enough mental strength. As soon as the former general director plunged into the documents, he immediately struck despair. He bought the experience, Alexander continued talking to himself. Who should I sell it to now? It's not the most liquid commodity, if you look at it. Although, how many times did Henry Ford go bankrupt before he became a national legend? He did it, and I can do it. For some reason, he couldn't think of any similarly positive examples in domestic history. Bankrupts often ended up in the dock, where they were called crooks, or they simply disappeared, and no one wanted to search for them. Such an outcome, of course, could not be excluded, but I did not want to allow it. It was necessary to escape, to hide at least for a while. That's why he grasped yesterday's call, the way one who falls into an abyss grasps for air. Good afternoon, said the velvet voice on the other end of the line. Allow me to introduce myself, Emmanuel Turk. And you must be Alexander. I was told you were looking for a job. Aya. Alexander was surprised. Not that I'm looking, but I'm willing to consider suggestions. Do you need a family doctor? Or are you planning to open a chain of clinics? You were recommended as an extremely qualified surgeon. The voice continued. We need just such a specialist for a very specific task. What kind of work? Alexander asked. Here, you know, they say all sorts of things about me. We are not interested in biography and other people's words. Emmanuel cut him off. We do not abandon our own people and do not give them to anyone. As you understand, I can't say anything over the phone. But, Alexander, my time is worth a lot of money, the voice said ingratiatingly. Instead of dropping everything and rushing to me, you ask meaningless questions. You speak in riddles, said the surgeon. I speak in riddles, corrected the man and laughed. Do you know the village of Raznovino? Come as soon as possible before another person takes your place. The surgeon began to realize where he had heard the name before. I think he had seen a big investigation that some millionaire had bought a huge plot of land in the neighborhood, restored an old manor house, and was now building a kind of commune there. He had a funny name, like the president of France. And now, having made a journey of 500 kilometers, without a single break Alexander was approaching the goal. A strange invitation, but dare he expect anything better. The lights of a village appeared in the distance. The navigator claimed that the destination was 15 minutes away. The first thing the millionaire must have done was to correct the road leading to the village, because the canvas was perfect. It was this that played the fatal role. At the very entrance to the village, near the sign with the name Rasmovidno, the surgeon did not slow down. A shadow flashed. Suddenly, in the twilight, right in his path, he saw a silhouette. Definitely a woman. Long black hair, dark dress. He sharply pressed the brake and heard a bang. The horror made Alexander want to scream. By the age of 50, Emmanuel had reached unprecedented heights and sank into ennui. It's good to have something to strive for. First, you collect money for a new car, and in five years you start building a summer house or pay for your child's education. It's great when you climb smoothly, step by step, and you reach the last one already a respectable age, when reaching the top coincides with the sunset of not only professional, but also biological life. In this sense, Emmanuel was unlucky. At 50, he realized that there was nowhere to go further. Having made huge capitals in banking, he profitably distributed them in a variety of directions. Whatever he took on, everything turned into silver, if not gold. He made a fortune in cryptocurrencies. Emmanuel believed in their potential when his colleagues laughed at digital. But success has a downside. A lot of knowledge increases sorrow, and a lot of achievements increase ennui. You get used to victories like to the strongest drug. And after the 50th anniversary, which Emmanuel celebrated with a big celebration in Tuscany, 
He was overcome by sadness. What's next? He thought every day. The millionaire had fulfilled every wish he could, not only his own, but also those of his wife, children, close relatives and friends. The question of what to do next became more and more acute. Then he remembered the dilapidated farmstead he had seen in the village of Raznovidnoy five years ago. He had been brought there by his failed business partners who wanted to build a factory near the dying village. That time Emmanuel felt that even his touch would not be enough to turn the cursed earth into gold, silver, or at least copper. Or was it that he was just being tricked? We need a strategic investor, said one of the failed partners. We see huge potential in this industry. Emmanuel got bored, went to the men's room and escaped. It was March, but the ground was still frostbound. In his expensive Italian boots, he reached the abandoned manor house of someone's family nest, with columns, balustrades, and other architectural delights. Wandered through the dark rooms, trying to figure out what had been here before. I imagined dinner parties and parties, imagined the gathering of a huge family after the birth of a child or the death of a grandmother. He was transported back to the times of kings, nobility, and balls. He was brought out of his oblivion by the ringing, gaudy voice of a girl laughing. She was 14 years old, and she was sitting on a carved chair that had miraculously survived in one of the rooms. What is your name? He asked her. Sophia, the girl replied and smiled. Why do you come here? I see people calling my name, she explained, suddenly becoming serious. It's so nice and quiet here. He didn't understand what came over him at that moment. Why he suddenly liked the girl until his heart ached. He approached her, took her by the shoulders, and then the fog set in. Nothing like that had ever happened to him before or since. He went back to the village and said a firm no to the guys who wanted access to his money. Walked around looking around for backstabbers. When he got back to Washington, he went to church for a long time, prayed told the guards to keep an eye on the girl and help her family. And when he found out Sophia's mom and dad were impenetrable alcoholics, he took the kid in. But she had a peculiar temperament. She now and then ran away to return to her native village. Sophia, he said to the girl when she was found again, you're upsetting me. I want to go home, she replied. I'm an adult. I can go wherever I want. You should have come with me to celebrate my 50th birthday the millionaire said. We had a wonderful time. Your heart is empty, Sophia said sternly, and I have a house, but you prevent me from going there, and all the time you want me to keep quiet. Then we'll go back there together, Emmanuel said. I persuaded him. He arrived in Raznovinoy and decided to linger. The village continued to keep his secrets, like a secret offshore reserve of money for a rainy day. Raznovidnoy had only one secret, but what a secret. He would have loved to erase it from his memory, but he couldn't. He bought and reconstructed the manor. A hundred workers worked day and night. He built a beautiful and smooth road, as if for an exhibition. But it wasn't enough. How was Sophia? Emmanuel asked the head of the security service on duty. No change, he replied. Escape to her kennel. We're on it boss. Every time Emmanuel asked himself, had anyone found out his secret, and he hoped not, or his whole beautiful life, his wonderful picture, would fall apart. He made Sophia a luxurious room with its own bathroom, beautifully painted walls, and a four-poster bed. But she kept running away to her parents' house, a dilapidated, dilapidated hut, and wouldn't even let her tidy it up and the banker went about his favorite business of recruiting people. One could not hurry anywhere, because he did not set any deadlines for his project. A surgeon, Alexander is just one man among dozens of others. He needs doctors, not philosophers. He doesn't need advice or encouragement, and therein lies the greatest difficulty. He needs people who stand at the line themselves, lest they ferret out his secrets and make life even harder. The surgeon looked at himself in the rearview mirror. His face was white as paper. Who had he hit? After all, 
He had heard a thousand times that at dusk, outside the city, you should be careful. That in small villages people don't realize the dangers of cars. How fast was he going? Sixty kilometers at least, slowly, as if wanting to delay the moment of meeting the inevitable. The doctor opened the door. He went out into the street. The fresh country air made him dizzy at once. He walked around the car around no one and nothing. Only on the left fender is a small mark, not even a dent. Just a scratch, you can polish it. But the sound was very strong. Good evening, a voice sounded behind him. Alexander flinched and turned around. Behind him, as if appearing out of nowhere, stood a good old. The wind fluttered her coal-black hair. Her arms were crossed on her chest, all wearing bracelets and other jewelry, crosses and symbols unknown to him. Around her neck was an amulet with a devil hanging from its tail. The girl was dressed in a black dress and heeled shoes, highly unusual for the countryside. Hello. The surgeon's mouth is dry. I hit someone. I, I, I heard the sound. Nonsense, said the girl in black. There was no one here but me. Tell me honestly, did I hit you? Alexander continued. Just now, you may have a fever. Then you don't feel any pain. I'm a big specialist. I can examine you. No, said the girl. I only saw your car stop. I was sent to meet you. And there was no one else here. As for examining, I don't want to do that yet. But I won't rule out the possibility. But I heard a thump. Alexander whispered in bewilderment. A thud, as if something had been struck. That's the mark it left. You are wrong, the girl said firmly. Can we go? I'm cold. I've been here for an hour. Where to? The surgeon asked. To your benefactor, she said with incomprehensible contempt and suddenly looked up. Shadows flickered in the night sky, looking a little like small birds. Stoats, she whispered. They won't calm down. They sense an intruder. Alexander shrugged his shoulders. He liked the situation less and less. They got into the car and drove forward. On the way, the surgeon wanted to stop and examine the girl. Suddenly, she did not realize what had happened. The stranger resembled a witch from a popular TV series. Now the surgeon was tormented by doubts. Is she really like that, or is she also playing a role? While the girl showed the way, Alexander furtively looked at her hands. No scratches. If she had fallen, bruises and abrasions could not be avoided. The surgeon was sweating from the fear he had experienced, his shirt sticking to his body. They drove on, past the old houses and barns. Call me Mr. M. The Turk asked. I like it better that way. That's how all my business associates and friends address me. What am I talking about? If those people could build buildings like that, maybe they were remarkable in their own way. There were no polyurethane moldings, no 3D printers to print patterns on columns. I want to revitalize the family nest. I'm still optimistic about the future. A girl entered the living room carrying a tray. When she turned her back and bent down to place a cup of green tea and a dish of chocolates in front of Alexander, a red figure became visible through her white shirt. It looked like a tattoo or a birthmark. It's from Belgium, the millionaire explained, pointing to the chocolate. My favorite. I believe that if you can't resist temptation, you should sin with flavor. What is my role? Alexander asked, coughing with embarrassment. Perhaps if it weren't for his delicate financial situation, he would have gotten back into his Mercedes and driven away from the mansion. A large community, like Rasnovidnoi or Sumbi, needs its own dispensary, Mr. M shrugged. I hear you're in distress, you've lost your job. My terms are you stay here, create a dispensary for the residents, get a tiny salary, and live happily ever after. Actually, I am a doctor in demand, Alexander resented. In Washington, I will be offered a substantial salary. But you didn't listen, Mr. M stretched out. A tiny salary into an account, and the rest in an envelope. In person, from me. To hide his embarrassment, Alexander took a piece of Belgian candy in his hand and took a bite. He did not like sweets, 
but the taste of this treat caused a wave of emotions in him. Definitely, this millionaire knows how to live. There is a question, said the surgeon, sipping from his mug. Who will be treated in the outpatient clinic? You and your family. The millionaire laughed. In his eyes suddenly appeared a light as if he wanted to tell Alexander something funny and disgusting at the same time. But he held back. Mr. Am was only able to calm down after taking a few sips of tea. No, not at all, he said, laughing. My family is in Austria. With my wife, you know, we've been together for 30 years and relations have become somewhat cool. My eldest daughter is studying art in the UK. Promised to visit next summer, but she hasn't been to the US most of her life and is probably a bit apprehensive about the trip. So only locals will be treated. Tempting, said the surgeon. The idea of sitting out in the middle of nowhere doing odd jobs seemed great to him. I suppose you assumed I wouldn't refuse. I assumed, nodded the millionaire. Since you've already agreed, I'll make one more condition. Promise not to jump up from the table and shout, okay. Sophia dreamed of the night sky again. She was flying, flapping her wings, circling the city. This dream, the same dream, had haunted her for ten years now. Ever since the day she'd met Emmanuel, the meeting had changed her whole life. Six months later, she found herself in Washington, D.C., immersed in a completely different world she'd never imagined existed. Now, when Sophia was flying through the night sky in her dream, the events seemed simple and unambiguous. But then, ten years ago, she could not calm down and roared and roared. What if someone found out what the millionaire had done to her? What if there were whispers and judgments in the street? There were lights downstairs, over every house, over every street. All these were secrets, and she, flying over the city, could peer into the windows and gather them. Sophia saw everything, treason, betrayal, theft, and jealousy. Everyone has a whole collection of secrets. At that moment, realizing how imperfect people are, how much worse each of them is than her, the girl felt better. In the village, she had been called a witch since she was a child, all because of her grandmother. She was a witch doctor. She read tarot cards, read spells. Mom did not pass neither appearance nor gift, but no one doubted her, Sophia. That's why so often she ran away from everyone and went to the manor, abandoned a century ago, badly damaged by time. It was there that she met her benefactor, tempter, and destroyer. Now the night was ending, it was time to descend. As the sun appeared in the east, the lights of the mysteries faded. She could no longer so easily look into a stranger's house and see something that would make her feel better. And the last conversation she had had with Turk had been a nuisance. He had argued with her again and insisted that she had to marry, that he was tired of helping and was completely exhausted, worrying about the girl. Sophia had a different opinion on the matter. The millionaire was the first to give up and started raising his voice and throwing objects off the table to vent his emotions. You ungrateful hillbilly, shouted Emmanuel. I gave you everything. How dare you hope for such a thing? No, the girl snapped at him. You would leave me alone, do you hear? Leave me alone. I don't want Italy. I don't want Washington. It is true what they say about you, that you are a witch, the millionaire hissed. But then his voice suddenly changed and became pleading. Will you ever forgive me, Sophia? I have apologized so many times. Never, replied the girl. She opened her eyes, the dream was over. Sophia was back in her parents' house, dirty, shabby, but still alive. Both mom and dad hadn't waited for her to return. Maybe they hadn't even noticed that Turk had taken her back to Washington. The bright sun shone through the window, which she disliked so much, but the mood was still wonderful. She thought about what she would do to Emmanuel's new guest, visualizing in her head, and her ideas made a voluptuous smile appear on her pretty face. Last night seemed like a dream. Waking up on the small bed, Alexander was reconstructing the events in his memory. 
the burn hurt, it was necessary to find ointment to heal faster. He also had a feeling of farce. It was as if he was caught in a huge prank, and at the end the cameraman with a sharp-tongued presenter was sure to jump out. He was roused from his slumber by a phone call. It was the landlady. There's something feudal about renting an apartment. Once you rent a corner, you have a landlord who can react painfully to sudden departures, and to whom you pay a monthly rent just by living on his concrete land. Alexander, the voice on the phone belongs to Leslie, an elderly tenant from Washington. Alexander, I don't understand. Where are you? I left, answered the surgeon, yawning. I went on a business trip. On a long trip. For more than three years, he rented from her an excellent apartment in a good neighborhood. The beginning of the lease coincided with the start of his adventurous clinic. An ordinary doctor, even the head of a department, could hardly afford a three-bedroom with a view of old Washington. But the director of a private clinic could. But you promised to pay me back, said the landlady, her voice losing its affability. And I believed it. You've been playing me for three months. Don't you realize that I'm losing my money? It's like a kindergarten. I'll pay you back, Alexander promised. I'll pay you back. Let's fix the amount within a year. I'll pay it off. I swear. And for the utility company, the landlady asked. You claim that you don't allow late payments. I came to the MFC and I felt sick. My blood pressure was high. Because of you I had to part with a considerable amount of money. I will call you back, deceive the surgeon, drop the call, and put the phone number of his mistress already blacklisted. This part of the past needs to be dealt with decisively and irrevocably. What can she do? He would go to court, get a judgment, and spend years trying to enforce it. He has nothing to fear. His debt to the tenant was ridiculous against the background of his problems. What happened yesterday? First, he almost ran over a girl who looked like a witch. She came out of nowhere, and he could clearly hear the impact. But nothing, the witch was unharmed. Then Alexander drank tea in the company of a millionaire, who is in the top ten of the American Fords list. A little later, quite at night, he allowed Turk to brand himself on his back, just above the shoulder blade. Now the spot where he had been cauterized by his eccentric employer was sore, but he slept as soundly as a baby in his new position. I have my own rules, Mr. M explained, and accentuated that he does not deny choice. All my people have that seal. Consider it a little superstition if you like. It's how I believe I can help anyone who finds themselves in trouble. All right, Alexander replied, unbuttoning his shirt. Place your bets. The most curious thing was the fact that the millionaire personally heated the metal brand in the fireplace and cauterized the surgeon's skin himself. He did it quickly and accurately, one might even say professionally. And then he put a band-aid on the burns, all of which suggested that this was not the first time Mr. Am had performed the ritual. There was something intimate about the act that made Alexander feel a burning shame. But in his position, such a whim seemed a small price to pay for the opportunity to hide and escape from the angry tenant. Tomorrow morning, you will sign the papers, said the millionaire in parting. The lawyer will tell you how to protect the income from the claims of creditors. You talk about it so calmly, the surgeon shrugged. The burn site was aching. It would be a good idea to anesthetize it. I thought bankers hated insolvent debtors. Mr. M laughed again, as if Alexander had told a good joke. The millionaire looked at the surgeon warmly, as if he were teaching his son about fractions or wrong numbers. So, you do not owe me, but my worst competitors, he explained. Not even you, but your enterprise. By the way, if you think of starting something like this from now on, Hire a good operations director. Don't take this burden on yourself. I noticed a long time ago that doctors don't understand business processes very well. I don't think so, Alexander said. This experience has been enough for me for a lifetime. Never say never. We'll put you up here in the mansion for now. Helga will see you off, said the millionaire, yawning. 
I should be resting now. Otherwise, I won't be able to go jogging tomorrow morning. The girl who served him tea led him to a room at the back of the mansion. As she walked ahead, the surgeon was able to see the branding marks under her clothes. He suddenly wanted to take a closer look at the mark. Moreover, the girl looked good, and he was already hungry for female company. Alexander got a small room that looked like a servant's bedroom. You can wash here. The girl nodded at the door. The toilet is over there. Where did the brunette go? Alexander asked. Sophia. The girl smiled. I don't know. I guess she flew away on her broom again. A coven. Do you live here? We're on shift, she said. We work two weeks at a time. But you must be here all the time. Would you like to stay with me and show me what's what in this castle of yours? The surgeon asked hopefully. He wanted very much to spend the evening in the company of this beauty, to forget himself. No, the girl cut him off without further thought. Good night. The job interviews were tiring, but the nature of Divergent was inspiring. In the morning, Mr. M jogged to the lake where he could swim. In the afternoon, it was time to cycle. And in the evening, he could work out in the gym with a personal trainer. It was best to keep a surgeon on hand just in case you sprain a ligament or have another injury. If everything went according to plan, and there was no reason to doubt it, the outpatient clinic would be ready in three months. Helga, Emmanuel said, turning to his assistant. In the evening, a dinner party. Invite the surgeon too, let him get used to it. And the general? Um. Mr. M thought for a moment, and after a few seconds said, yes, invite him, or he'll be offended. He's got a good family. Just tell him there'll be no alcohol. He'll bring his own, Helga said. The millionaire rubbed his chin. He won't bring much with him. You realize I don't want to see him get drunk again. I don't know why we put up with him. Alexander spent the whole day in the library studying documents. The outpatient clinic was as well designed as his failed clinic. Unknown experts calculated the maximum workload formed a staff schedule, and even a plan for the purchase of medicines. Studying the documents, the surgeon could only marvel at the high level and foresight of those who had prepared them. Mr. Doctor, Alexander heard a familiar voice. You're not going to dinner. The surgeon looked up and saw the same girl who had met him in Brasmovidmoy. She wore a short black sleeveless dress, and Alexander saw her tattoos. On the left forearm was drawn a horned monster in a jacket and tie, and on the right Baphomet in the image of a Japanese warrior with a samurai sword. Flashy makeup, neat manicure girl looked completely different from yesterday. I don't know, replied the surgeon, trying to hide his interest. What kind of dinner? The benefactor holds them every week, on Wednesdays, the girl explained. He invited you too. But Helga is afraid to tell you. She said you made an indecent proposal to her last night. She's a decent girl, all blushed and drank Valerian half the night. God forbid, waved his hand surgeon, feeling like a blush. Nothing like that happened. She must have misunderstood me. I'll have to apologize. Oh, I want to apologize for last night, too, Sophia said. I don't know what came over me. What happened? Alexander asked. The evening was just like the evening. You left as soon as we crossed the threshold of the mansion. When you drove up, you hit a plastic post, she explained. You know, the kind they put up to mark the curb. You thought it was me. I should have realized and said so right away. Instead, I just played the part of some note-taking fool. But I have an excuse. I waited an hour for you under a gloomy sky. It makes you see the world differently than it really is. Oh, you mean that? The surgeon stretched out. How did he not look at this girl yesterday? She was very beautiful, and her demonic image was frightening and attractive at the same time. The main thing is that it's not you. I hope you can find a decent suit in your closet, the girl said, critically examining his shirt and jeans. Maybe a shirt, too. And a tie. I'm sure you'd look great in a tie. I'll find one. But to tell you the truth, 
I'm not really ready to party tonight. Oh, you're mistaken, Sophia smiled, and there was something sinister in her look again. A soiree is not about fun, it's about vanity and trying to hide something shameful, something I love about people. I'm sure you won't refuse me, so come on over. See you later, Mr. Doctor. The girl was both attractive and repulsive at the same time. Alexander folded the documents, sighed and thought that if he had the same strong project, his clinic would not have failed. Okay, it had failed. He could not understand why the media had started such a travesty of his brainchild, as if he was the only one to blame for the fact that the implants could be of poor quality. Interviews were tiring, but the nature of Rasnovidny inspired. In the mornings, Mr. M jogged to the lake where he could swim, in the afternoon it was time to bike, and in the evening he could work out in the gym with a personal trainer. It was best to keep a surgeon on hand, just in case you sprain a ligament or have another injury. If everything went according to plan and there was no reason to doubt it, the outpatient clinic would be ready in three months. Helga, Emmanuel said, turning to his assistant. In the evening, a dinner party. Invite the surgeon too. Let him get used to it. And the general. Um, Mr. M thought for a moment, and after a few seconds said, Yes, invite him or he'll be offended. He's got a good family. Just tell him there'll be no alcohol. He'll bring his own, Helga said. The millionaire rubbed his chin. He won't bring much with him. You realize I don't want to see him get drunk again. I don't know why we put up with him. Alexander spent the whole day in the library studying documents. The outpatient clinic was as well designed as his failed clinic. Unknown experts calculated the maximum workload, formed a staff schedule, and even a plan for the purchase of medicines. Studying the documents, the surgeon could only marvel at the high level and foresight of those who had prepared them. Mr. Doctor, Alexander heard a familiar voice. You're not going to dinner. The surgeon looked up and saw the same girl who had met him in Rasnovigno. She wore a short black sleeveless dress, and Alexander saw her tattoos. On her left forearm was drawn a horned monster in a jacket and tie, and on her right befomit as a Japanese warrior with a samurai sword. Flashy makeup, neat manicure girl looked completely different from yesterday. I don't know, replied the surgeon, trying to hide his interest. What kind of dinner? The benefactor holds them every week, on Wednesdays, the girl explained. He invited you too, but Helga is afraid to tell you. She said you made an indecent proposal to her last night. She's a decent girl, all blushed and drank Valerian half the night. God forbid, waved his hand surgeon, feeling like a blush. Nothing like that happened. She must have misunderstood me. I'll have to apologize. Oh, I want to apologize for last night, too, Sophia said. I don't know what came over me. What happened? Alexander asked. It was just a night out. You left as soon as we stepped through the mansion. When you drove up, you hit a plastic bullet, she explained. You know, the kind they put up to mark the curb. You thought it was me. I should have realized and said so right away. Instead, I just played the part of some note-taking fool. But I have an excuse. I waited an hour for you under a gloomy sky. It makes you see the world differently than it really is. Oh, you mean that? The surgeon stretched out. How did he not look at this girl yesterday? She was very beautiful, and her demonic image was frightening and attractive at the same time. The main thing is that it's not you. I hope you can find a decent suit in your closet the girl said, critically examining his shirt and jeans, maybe a shirt, too, and a tie. I'm sure you'd look great in a tie. I'll find one. But to tell you the truth, I'm not really ready to party tonight. Oh, you're mistaken, Sophia smiled, and there was something sinister in her look again. A soiree is not about fun, it's about vanity and trying to hide something shameful, something I love about people. I'm sure you won't refuse me, so come on over. See you later, Mr. Doctor. The girl was both attractive and repulsive at the same time. 
Alexander folded the documents, sighed and thought that if he had the same strong project, his clinic would not have failed. Okay, it had failed. He could not understand why the media had started such a travesty of his brainchild. As if he was the only one to blame for the fact that the implants could be of poor quality. In the heart of the sizeless mansion was a fireplace room. The floor had been restored to its original appearance, alternating white and black tiles. It was amazing how this work had survived nearly a century of neglect. The ceiling was decorated with stucco in the Baroque style, fanciful patterns that were hard to take your eyes off of. As if mesmerized, the doctor looked up, admiring bouquets of flowers, fruits, leaves made of plaster. Do you like it? Mr. M asked. The surgeon immediately straightened up, as if embarrassed by his curiosity. Oh, everyone has that reaction. No need to be embarrassed. I love art. You can spend hours looking at beauty, can't you? I love mascarones the most. You probably know that plaster masks of people and animals. Look, they're all over the place. There's one that looks like me. Can you find it? Alexander looked closely and saw dozens of images, above doors, above windows, in corners. On the masks were the faces of mythical creatures and animals, and on one surgeon was ready to swear he saw the features of Sophia's face. True, the millionaire was not found. The sculptor had hidden him in a secluded place. In the hall gathered about two dozen guests, from invisible speakers played classical music to match the audience. How beautiful, Alexander said. His mood had indeed improved. It was as if he was back in the time of kings, jewels, and poets. Are you talking about Sophia? Smiled the millionaire. I'm glad I liked her. A charming girl, by the way, a local. I took her into my family about ten years ago. They say all sorts of things about her, like she's a witch, a sorceress. Don't believe it. She's a real beauty, just a little peculiar. The mood changed immediately and Alexander felt a little uncomfortable. It was as if he had come into contact with some dirty secret that everyone wanted to forget. The owner of the manor went on, greeting the guests, and the surgeon was left alone. He beckoned to the waiter and took a glass of drink. Inside, he would have sworn it was champagne, but non-alcoholic, though at this point he wouldn't mind a little drink. Be careful, Alexander heard a voice behind him and turned around sharply. Right behind him stood a man in a ceremonial military uniform. The surgeon had a poor understanding of epaulettes, but these were clearly generals. Excuse me, Alexander asked. Allow me to introduce myself, the military man said and straightened up. Evan, retired military. I once commanded an entire district, but now I'm living out my days in retirement. Emmanuel Turk is our only comfort in this dump. We all pray to him like an icon. Nice to meet you, Alexander replied. My name is Alexander. I will work here as a surgeon. I arrived here last night. A doctor. The general became animated. A doctor is very good. We need doctors. Maybe you can honor me with a visit. No problem, shrugged the surgeon. But you said I should be careful. What did you mean by that? Not what, but who? The general corrected him. It's about Sophia. You should stay away from her. She is certainly a beautiful woman, but please forgive me for my liberty. Again, I apologize for such a crude comparison. What do you mean? Alexander asked in bewilderment. What does it mean, fallen? That's what I mean, Ivan shrugged. The girl is kind and sympathetic. She's not very good at relationships. She's had a lot of people fall into her net. And every one of them, you know, has some devilish thing going on. What nonsense. Alexander was indignant. I liked her. You know, she has a soul and personality. Exactly, said the general. That's exactly what I said, Fallen. I apologize. Do I dare expect our conversation to remain confidential? Of course. Thank you. The honor is mine. He nodded, clicked his heels and stepped aside. Sophia herself arrived much later when the hot dishes were being served. 
The guests didn't exactly shy away from her, but avoided her. She walked right up to Alexander and took him under her arm. I want coffee, the girl said with a smile. What do you think? I think it's a little late for coffee, Alexander shrugged. If only with milk and not strong. It sounds delicious, Sophia replied and licked the corner of her lip. I'll drink you down. What? I said, I'll drink you down, the girl shrugged. The hallmark of the best staff is discreetness. You don't see the waiter until you need his services, and then he appears as if from nowhere. And now, as they approached the drinks table, a man in a white shirt appeared beside them. The obliging bartender made them two cups and set them on the table. That night, the witch behaved differently from the night before. She joked with him, discussed life in the capital and in the village, and asked him about his family. How did you decide? She wondered. I don't know if I could have abandoned my child, but I did not. With heat exclaimed the surgeon. I'm just not allowed to see her. It's just a matter of time. I will definitely get custody of her. Suddenly her eyes were filled with demonic fire again, and her smile became intimidating. There are easier ways to accomplish your goals. I could teach. If you are talented. As Alexander thought about what to say to this bold suggestion, Helga approached him. Sophia gave her a piercing look that sent shivers down her spine. Emmanuel's assistant whispered in her ear as if the girls were competing to see who could make the surgeon more anxious. Mr. M is asking to come up. The host of the evening was literally blooming in glory. He wore a tailcoat, but of a very bold cut. His shirt was a democratic blue color, and his bounty was stylized under the flag of the European Union. When he saw the doctor, he smiled broadly. Having a good time, aren't you? In the company of wonderful girls. Not bad, agreed the doctor. But you didn't tell me about these soirees. Are you nervous? The millionaire was surprised. You look a little pale. I just haven't come to my senses yet. You remember that in my position, it is better to keep out of the public eye. Come on, old chap. Mr. M clapped him on the shoulder, made a gesture with his hand, and the music died down. Dear friends, he said loudly, let's welcome another member of our friendly team. This is Alexander, a talented surgeon. He has the most difficult task which he will cope with, of course. We'll help him get rid of his fears and doubts, won't we? There was a round of applause, and the doctor was really embarrassed by the attention. Some men came up to shake his hand, and the ladies gave him smiles. Suddenly he saw the old general who had suggested he beware of the witch walk out the door. And not alone. After eleven pound the guests began to disperse. Mr. M had disappeared but his assistant was able to relax. She sat on a satin chair and ate her cake with a small spoon. She was nibbling a little bit at a time as if she wanted to stretch the pleasure. Helga, said the surgeon, I wanted to apologize for yesterday. What was yesterday? She wondered, wiping her lips with her handkerchief. I'm sorry. What was what? Well, I made an indecent proposal. I'm very ashamed, it's true. The girl wrinkled her forehead for a while. What a talented actress, thought the surgeon. Then her face seemed to brighten, and she laughed. Ah, you offered yesterday to show me the estate, she remembered, and smiled slyly. Oh God, I've never done that before. You ask again, and I will not refuse. With pleasure, replied the surgeon, not understanding the hint, but some other time. Listen. I'm glad we're on a first-name basis. I need to talk to Sophia. Where's her room? I think she's busy right now, Helga hissed, and there was no trace of her sleek smile. She went back to the cake and broke off a large piece with a spoon. I saw her going out in the company of that what's-his-name. Evan? Yes, yes, nodded the assistant. You won't find her here. She'll fly to her lair. Where to where? Alexander was surprised. She's a local, Helga explained. She was born here and raised here. Mr. M took her to Washington out of self-pity. And then he moved here. 
but that's just a story. He tells that story a lot, so bear with him. Anyway, this is her parents' house. It's a creepy den that's about to collapse. You don't want to go there and waste your time. Can I find her there? The surgeon didn't take the hint. Okay. The girl gave up and looked at Alexander with poorly concealed disappointment. Where is your phone? Here without a map will not understand. And one more thing. If you want to go Eluyal, there's a loophole in one place. Just don't tell him, okay? All absences and departures must be authorized by him. He's very particular about that. Alexander ran into his room and threw off his jacket. He needed to change and find Sophia urgently. The coffee had a different effect than he was used to. A terrible fatigue suddenly took over his body. He thought that if he lay down for a few minutes, it wouldn't be a big deal. He figured out roughly how to find the witch. Navigator to the rescue. After changing his clothes, he sat down on the bed and closed his eyes for a few minutes. After a while, refreshed and rested, the surgeon went on his way. Not wanting to meet the guards, he simply swung over the fence at the secret place Helga had told him about. The air was more invigorating than coffee. The June night was warm. Alexander wandered past the houses and thought about the fate of the villain. Yesterday, he was suffering in Washington, surrounded by a pack of angry creditors. Today, he was attending a dinner party. He quickly found the cabin Helga had told him about. He went to the window, peered in and saw a faint light. He knocked on the door and it opened. The whole hut consisted of a small corridor and a room. The windows were shuttered and the room was dark. The girl had changed her clothes, too. Now she really resembled a witch. She wore a burgundy dress, a low-cut hoodie, and her chest was adorned with a huge red stone on a chain. She had changed her hair, too, and now her black eyes looked at him from behind her bangs. Alexander looked at the girl and felt fear again, as if he were a rabbit on a rendezvous with a bow constrictor. Hello again, Sophia said in a low voice. I hate bright lights. I love strong coffee. Would you have some? The surgeon nodded. The girl lit the scented candles and also the flame under the flask. In it, the girl brewed coffee, and when bubbles appeared on the liquid, she threw some herbs. He sat down on some kind of cushion right on the floor. He took the mug with the hot drink in his hands. It tasted unusual. You're worried, the witch said. You're nervous. What's wrong? I'm here, and my family's in Washington. The surgeon shrugged. I miss my daughter very much, and my wife, of course. Tell me, the witch demanded. Tell me about her. Well, we met at a club, ten years ago, began the surgeon. Do you know what clubs are? Sure, nodded the girl. A disgusting place where everyone pretends to be rich, beautiful, and successful and then try to convince each other of their eternal love while standing over the toilet. How rude, but on the whole, yes. Katenka looked down on me, Alexander continued. I had just graduated from medical university. I had an internship. I remember I couldn't even buy her a daiquiri at that club. Let's have a beer, I said. She agreed, so we became friends. Her last name didn't ring a bell, Stone. Stone and stone. And then I found out what kind of girl she was, and believe it or not, I decided I had to have her. I made it happen. What went wrong? The witch asked haughtily, sipping her coffee. You said it like you knew the answer, the surgeon muttered. Sophia laughed, and the sound sent shivers down Alexander's spine. You fell in love not with a man, but with money, the witch said reproachfully. You would have given up your own surname if one man had insisted, also for the money. But he didn't insist because, unlike you, he looks into the depths of things. So, what, said the surgeon, as if justifying himself. Volkov is a good name. Besides, I was accepted into the family as a relative. No, I really loved Catherine. I really did. The money was just a nice bonus. Besides, it ran out quickly. I figured I'd earn just as much. The coffee made me dizzy. 
It was too strong after all. It seemed to him that while his body was sitting on the pillow, he was floating around this old hut, flying up to the ceiling and down. He wished he could go outside and soar into the sky. He hasn't felt so light in a long time. There's a way to get it all back, the witch said. If not everything, at least some of it. Come here. Apologize, the surgeon asked defiantly. I tried. My father-in-law wouldn't even let me in. You can ask for help, the girl said vaguely, looking at the flames in the fireplace. By the fire. Fire is my favorite element. Will it help? Alexander asked mockingly. Wouldn't it be better to call some spirits right away? You just don't believe, Sophia said, but you should. What do you want? How much? Alexander thought about it. To see Casey, of course. Take her to the movies. Take her for a walk. Two homework together. Breaking up with kids is hard. Especially if you didn't leave on your own, but were kicked out. He looked hopefully at the witch. I know what I want, Alexander said. But, don't tell me, Sophia demanded in that low, scary voice, but keep it in your head. She began to perform a strange ritual. She opened a glass bottle of water, poured it into an old, dirty jug, tossed in some powder and there was a hissing sound. The room filled with steam or smoke. Alexander began to feel dizzy, and a nasty chill ran through his body. He suddenly wanted to run. The witch began to cast spells in an incomprehensible language. As the surgeon twitched, a hand was on his shoulder, heavy as a boulder. He couldn't even move as he watched the rituals. And then the witch sat on top of him, lifting his dress, and continued reciting her spells, similar to prayers or mantras, but now right in his face. Keep it in your head, she shouted in a terrible voice, and the surgeon's hair went up in a puff. The smoke cleared. He looked at Sophia, at her long black hair, her dark eyes, her shirt. While she was performing the ritual, the top button on her dress had come undone so tightly her lush breasts were exposed. He suddenly wanted to get this witch to possess her, to make her become only his. She noticed the look, put her heavy hand on the back of Alexander's head, pulled the surgeon to herself, and kissed him hotly. Together, they fell first onto the pillows, and then rolled onto the bare floor, merging together. And in a moment, when they became one, Alexander suddenly felt himself filled with power. He could defeat his father-in-law, his creditors, and even the naughty rock. Exhausted, he pulled Sophia away from him and smiled broadly. Only now he heard that his phone was ringing. Answer it, the witch commanded. The fog dissipated. The phone was indeed ringing on the windowsill, where he had placed it before resting for a couple minutes. It was already nine in the morning. How time flies. It's only a dream, thought the surgeon, waking up in a sweat. He was lying in his room. The dense curtains blocked the light, so the sun did not wake him up. He had the strength to change his clothes, but not to go looking for the witch. He didn't even know if he liked the vision or not. But one sound that seeped out of the dream was a phone call. Alexander looked at the screen and could not believe his eyes. Catherine, his wife, already ex-wife, was it really necessary to answer it? Yes, he said in a voice hoarse from sleep. Hi, hello, Catherine. Alexander, his voice was shaking. His ex-wife was crying. Alexandra, come. Come to us soon. What's wrong? Daddy, daddy's not well. Suddenly, the connection was cut off. The phone went dead. I forgot to charge it last night. Alexander rushed to his bag, took out the wires and plugged in the phone. It took him a long time to come to his senses and Roy didn't want to boot up. After five or seven minutes, the phone finally turned on. He dialed his ex-wife's cell phone busy. Suddenly it rang. Alexander, he heard a stranger. What time should I pick you up? I'm around if you need me. The voice stretched the words and spoke with a strange accent. It sounded like, what time do you want to stop by? Drive where? The surgeon was surprised. What do you mean, where? 
We talked about this yesterday. It's me, Harry, the foreman. Kill me. I don't remember, Alexander thought. There was no alcohol at the dinner party. Sorry, apologized the surgeon. I forgot all about it. And slept, chuckled the foreman. Nothing, the case is young. In about 20 minutes it will be fine. But they won't let me over the fence, so you go out on your own. The clock showed ten. Alexander grabbed fresh underwear and rushed into the shower. After a few minutes he came to his senses, quickly wiped down his body and got dressed. Even the staff bathroom was decorated in a classic style. The shower cubicle stood on a snow-white pedestal. The ceiling was decorated with freezers. But the surgeon had no time to admire the beauty. He grabbed his cell phone, his diary, and ran outside. Outside the gate was already an old Volkswagen. The driver blinked at him. Did you really forget? The driver was a man in his forties, obscenely thin. He looked good, but the look was spoiled by a nasty red mustache. Yes, nodded the surgeon. I guess the fresh air does that to me. Wow. The foreman slammed his hand on the steering wheel. We discussed everything yesterday. Well, let's go. It's just two kilometers away. A perfect road went all the way to the construction site. The surgeon had a cognitive dissonance. He had been to the backcountry, but he had never seen such smooth asphalt 500 kilometers from Washington. The future outpatient clinic was fenced and enclosed by a corrugated metal fence. There were neat cabins for the workers. Mr. M seemed to take any project seriously, even if it was a small clinic for the locals. This is where we're building, the foreman said with a wave of his hand, more trouble than profit. They decided to build the outpatient clinic on the site of the former club. The building really looked good, thick walls, high ceilings. Additional offices and a ramp were added to it. The workers had already started to tidy up the premises, remove the garbage, installed electricity, plastered and pasted the walls. As soon as they entered the territory, the foreman started running and fussing, giving instructions. Put on a hard hat. What project? The man said, opening a folder with drawings. The surgeon looked at them, but didn't understand anything at first. Too many lines, thick and thin, straight and dotted. Too many numbers. You need good ventilation, Alexander said, pretending to read the project. Forced ventilation and a sink in every office. That's the minimum. We'll do it. The man nodded and jabbed his finger at the papers. Here, look, it's in the project. I'll show you the conclusions on the walls. What's wrong? The foreman immediately showed him the pipes sticking out of the walls and began to explain where the water supply and the sewage system were. That the outpatient clinic will have its own boiler, even if it is expensive to maintain, but there will be no interruptions in supply. He talked and talked, and the surgeon began to feel dizzy from the flow of words. And we will insulate powerfully, he promised, stretching the sounds, to save money. We'll put in a recuperation system. Well, you walk around, take a look. You've got work to do here. By the way, how did Mr. Lord you here? Alexander walked around the future outpatient clinic and was surprised by the order at the site. Everywhere clean and neat. At the construction sites where he had been before, there were cigarette butts, empty bottles and garbage everywhere, and the dust was as thick as a finger. There was nothing like that here, not even close, and the workers were moving not chaotically, but purposefully. Walking down the corridor, the surgeon looked at one of the construction workers. Tall and thin, he was concentrating in front of the wall, inspecting it for flaws. As if sensing his gaze, he turned around. He looked at the surgeon appraisingly, as if trying it on. He smirked. You should run away from here. Baron sniffed the man's nose. Run away forever. Archie shouted the foreman, appearing out of nowhere, and accompanied his words with a selective mate. I told you not to talk to the doctor. Keep your mouth shut. I told you, didn't I? Have you finished plastering? Have you cleaned up all the garbage? There's no trace of the stretching and the weird accent. 
strange man. So, I, that's, the man mumbled. That's me. That means, that, that, spat the foreman. All, minus the Burmese, he said. And when the worker began to fawn, immediately shunned him. All free. If you talk too much, you'll be out of a job. Alexander stood there, not understanding. As if seeing him for the first time, the foreman again smiled broadly. This is our order, he explained and again began to stretch the words. You can't smoke, drink alcohol, or talk to the customer on the construction site. Not on any pretext. And that helps, asked the surgeon. What and how, smiled foreman. His accent was coming back to him, along with his manners. It helps a lot. What deprived of a bonus once will remember, and will pass it on to the others. The surgeon dialed his ex-wife again and again, but the phone was always busy. In the evening, Catherine called back from another number, and from what he heard, Alexander became uncomfortable. He wanted to drop everything and rushed to Washington. The surgeon went to the mansion on foot and was ready to swear that yesterday, he also walked in the village only at night. He had deliberately deviated from his route to find the witch's hut. But now the houses seemed unfamiliar. Of course, he was dreaming, and his wife's call was a coincidence. She was crying again, begging him to come. She said she was scared, that her father woke up in the morning and couldn't raise his hand to say his name. And then he lost consciousness and has been in a coma for 24 hours. At this point, the surgeon thought gloatingly that he had long ago suggested that he examine his blood vessels and, if necessary, to be treated. What did he say? Right, called him a puppy and laughed. Now Alexander was facing a difficult choice to rush to his ex-wife or to show character. The father-in-law is still in the hands of professionals and they hardly need additional advice. With his money, he hardly felt the need to look for specialists. Unless, of course, he was conscious. Alexander was angry, recalling their conversation at the very beginning of his epic with the clinic. Then the surgeon had asked for money to start the project. No, his father-in-law had cut him off. I won't. I already gave you my daughter, and you do not give enough. Don't even ask, okay? And he didn't even apologize, didn't even try to sweeten the pill for the sake of decency unbearable man. But why? Alexander was surprised then. I'm a great specialist. I have a great idea. It will go off. All of Washington will be queuing up. Remember, Washington hates queues. If anything's gonna go off, it's gonna go off right in your face. You know why? My father-in-law asked me hotly. Because you want to make the world a better place. You can't make money that way. Why don't you sell silicone breasts or lip plumping? Or, if you don't want money, just say so, the surgeon said. Don't you get it? My father-in-law laughed. It's not the money that you're sorry for. Well, and money too, a little bit. Now gloating overflowed the surgeon's soul. If he hadn't run away from Washington so quickly, he could now operate on his father-in-law under the right circumstances. After all, it was his profile. He could do it cleanly, well, neatly. Give him treatment, and he could have a normal life again, not right away, but in six months to a year, and learn to walk and talk again. Good day. He was brought out of his oblivion by the voice of the guard. The surgeon returned to the mansion, already back. Yes, muttered Alexander. How are you, excuse me? Yesterday they had met, but he didn't remember the name. What had happened to him? A real fog, amnesia. But the guard took this memory lapse with understanding. My passport says Stephen, he said. But if someone calls me something else, I don't take offense. Like, permission to speak, or may I ask a question? Or even, hey, you, young man, Alexander said with a smile. Well, as they say, thank you on a kind word though I'm not that young. The guard looked to be about 40 years old, no less. Despite the warm weather, he wore a shirt and jacket. 
The dress code of the gods must have been the same in different countries and cities. I'd like to see my benefactor, the surgeon asked. To the chief, Stephen asked. Sure, do you know where his office is? Emmanuel Turk occupied the second floor. There were also many frills and luxuries here, for example, plaster busts of monarchs stood inside the niches. Alexander recognized Stephen, Catherine. A few niches were empty. Mr. M was optimistic about the future. Appointment? The guard outside the office asked. He wasn't as friendly as Stephen. I don't think I'll be denied an audience. The guard pressed the video call button and muttered surgeon. There was silence for a few seconds. Then a beep sounded. The door opened and Alexander stepped inside. Inside there were absolutely white walls and ceiling, light colored furniture. Instead of windows, Emmanuel's office had aquariums. There were fish swimming inside, but if you looked closely, the street was also visible. Mesmerized by the sight, Alexander did not even immediately notice that one of the walls was literally hung with monitors. They showed some graphs, texts, continuously updated. Do you like it? The millionaire was pleased with the impression the aquariums made. It was my idea. I call this office the White Absolute. The aquariums are also my idea. It's like you're at the bottom of the sea and there's an ocean outside. It's very distracting because I'm always working. Well, you see, he nodded towards the monitors. And there's fish, beautiful and original. Don't you think? Well, yes, nodded the surgeon and thought that the ancient truth is still true. If you don't praise yourself, no one will praise you. How are things progressing? Mr. M asked. Dare I hope that at the end of the summer, our dispensary will open its doors? Yes, nodded the surgeon. I'll be monitoring the facility remotely. It's all on cameras. No, I want you to stand over the workers. The millionaire exclaimed and jumped up from his chair. You have to work there, you and your staff, all day long, maybe even nights. By the way, where did you spend last night? I didn't see you leave dinner. Did I say goodbye in a decent house? Where did you spend the night? Alexander asked automatically. I spent it here. By the way, there is one more thing. You could say it's personal. What happened? My ex-wife called. She says her father-in-law is dying. He seems to be having a massive stroke, which is my specialty. I'm sure he's being treated by the best doctors in Washington. Emmanuel replied lazily. And your involvement would be redundant. Besides, I need you here. I'll drive there and back, Alexander asked. It will take a couple of days, no more. At least I'll get to see my daughter. Mr. Am stood up and went to the window. He gazed into the aquarium, watching the fish. One, colorful and bright, drew all his attention. But down below, in the mud, the catfish were swarming, always getting the dirty work. When the silence lengthened, and the surgeon wanted to cough to remind of his presence, the millionaire mentally surfaced from his aquarium. All right, I'll let you go, he said, but on one condition. When he named it, the surgeon's eyebrows went up. Tell me honestly, when was the last time you had your car serviced? Mr. M asked as he and the two guards walked into the garage. The rumble of the engine almost made me deaf. It was a diesel, the surgeon shrugged. They all make that noise. As they say, if a diesel engine runs quietly, it doesn't work. Nonsense and nonsense, the millionaire didn't appreciate the joke. Take a normal car. Take this Japanese electric car, for example. It's 500 kilometers one way, Alexander objected. I won't have enough range. Reasonably, nodded the millionaire. Then this beauty, he nodded at the black BMW. A very capacious engine, although the volume is small. Maybe I'd rather drive mine, stretched out the surgeon. Mercedes is brand worship. Mr. M said knowingly, you don't look at the nameplate when you choose a car. If you're taking my precious, I want to make sure it's safe. It's just that the cars themselves are better, Alexander said. There's the pinnacle of human evolution, and then there's technical thought. 
so I drive a Mercedes. Maybe you don't need to drive it. Tuck smiled. Maybe you just love it. Yes, I do, agreed the surgeon. He looked at his passion from a different angle, and to tell the truth, very much so. In his heart, he hoped Mr. Am would forbid him to go to Washington. After all, he was his employer now, and now, like, weekdays. The surgeon didn't even know if he wanted to see his daughter or not. He was confused. Sophia is my pain and sorrow, the millionaire suddenly spoke. I can't watch this flower wither. I worry about her, but I can't find a way to help her. She has such a painful beauty. How can I not love her? It's the kind of love that words can't convey. Anyone who marries her will be golden, said Mr. M, but it must be a worthy man, a very worthy man. What do you mean? Alexander asked, gilding. Adari, the millionaire, explained. Not the biggest, of course, but I can give you a hundred million. Of course, if I see and feel that love is strong, or at least the calculation is correct, do you have a worthy candidate in mind? He had the feeling that Emmanuel was bored in his village and therefore looking for entertainment. And right now he's playing some kind of game with him, the capital surgeon, paired with a village witch who couldn't be changed by years in Washington and not just Washington. Do I still have to take Sophia with me? The surgeon asked. Deep down, he hoped Mr. M would insist. It's out of the question. He cut him off. M take her and the BMW. I'll give you two days and then come back and get on with your work. It's very important to me that the outpatient clinic is completed on time. We'll call the TV. Do you want to? We'll get some officials so they can walk around, smack, and see how to work. Where is she? Where's Sophia? Don't worry, she'll come, smiled the millionaire. Have you heard what they call her here? Which, ha, huh, that's the cutest nickname I've ever heard. Don't look at me like I'm crazy. She called me this morning and asked me to take her to Washington. And here you are with your goddamn father-in-law. I guess there's no such thing as coincidence in this life. What do you think? The surgeon felt someone's eyes on him and turned around. Sophia was standing in the doorway. She was dressed unusually, if not provocatively. A playful look, as if they'd really spent the evening last night in each other's arms. From Archie's window, the lights of the manor house were visible. Five years ago, when the renaissance of someone else's family nest had begun, their village had begun to resemble a passing yard. Dozens of trucks snaked back and forth every day, but there was work. Archie also found himself at the construction site, plastering and puttying walls, listening to the mockery of the foreman, drinking vodka and cursing the bourgeoisie. And when he saw Sophia again, it was as if his heart was suspended on a string. He could not sleep or eat, only thinking about her all the time. Of course, she had changed a lot, molded herself. Tall, black-haired, with big cheekbones and beautiful breasts, she really did look like a witch now, with a demonic fire in her eyes and a devilish energy radiating from her. Archie, she said without preamble, I see a dark stain on you. You should come to my place. We'll do a ritual. After drinking an entire glass of vodka, he came to her hut that night. Sophia met him in a strange translucent garment. She recited some incantations, splashed muddy water on hot stones, and did other things. He wanted to cross himself, but she grabbed his arm tightly. From that day he lost his peace and thought only of Sophia. And when the rumor spread through the village that the banker would make her fiancé rich, what an impenetrable fool you are, the girl said when she saw him a few days later. Did you think you could get me? From then on, the taunts became regular. The witch, having drunk his soul, having taken his peace, showed her true face. He comes to her with flowers, she laughs. He bought her chocolate, she laughs. Sometimes she condescend to talk to him, but no more. During one of these conversations, Archie cried, smearing tears down his cheeks. Sophia, he said, let's live together, huh? Come on, I'll fix up your house, 
Make it a picture. Do you want to move into mine? I'll build you a room like in Washington. I'll work 24 hours a day. I'll work at a sawmill at night, as long as you don't need anything. But she laughed. She liked to see the village man suffer. With a beauty like her, he would never spend the night no matter how much you dream. And once he tasted the forbidden fruit, he became her toy forever. Why are you silent, Sophia? He asked. Tell me yes, I pray to Christ God. She stopped laughing and even grinned. The next day she gave him a note and called him to her, as if to meet her father, that is, the chief baron, to get acquainted. And when Archie went to the fence, found the wicket, and knocked inside, some foreheads jumped out. They beat him up like that for a week, he couldn't sleep on his left side, breathing once in a while, almost got away alive. However, he had some news about Sophia's life. First of all, she herself regularly visited the house of her parents on the edge of the village, which fueled rumors about her witchy essence. Secondly, a cook and a castellan from their village worked at the manor. They told me all sorts of things about Sophia, and usually the baron forbade them to talk about what was going on behind the beautiful fence, but here it was as if he didn't notice. Archie thought she had someone else, someone else forever, and he couldn't forgive her. Yesterday he'd seen him at the construction site, thin, tall, lustrous. How could he, a simple man whose hands are more delicate than the handle of an axe, did not know anything with such a pull? Tears ran down his cheeks from jealousy and heartache. He went outside before the wind, because there was no toilet in the house, and right by the door he noticed a white envelope. Archie crossed himself. Only an hour ago, when he'd come back from the store, it hadn't been there. Or had he imagined it? He took it in his hands. The paper was good, soft. He held it to his nose, smelling it so close, yet so inaccessible. I opened it with trembling hands, careful not to tear it. He held it up to his eyes so he could see the lines, and tears flowed from his eyes, but not of pain, but of joy. Do you want me to drive? Sophia asked. For several hours that they drove first on the country road and then on the highway, she did not sleep a wink. Only once did they stop for gas and coffee. No, Alexander smiled. The car is fire. Your father was right. He's not my father. Sophia snapped at him, and the smile disappeared from her face. They drove on in silence. The surgeon parked the black BMW near his father-in-law's cottage. And what had he found in this tasteless house before? After Emmanuel's mansion, the building looked both sad and shabby. But the millionaire's car was really good. 500 kilometers flew by in one breath. His neck or back didn't even get stiff. He got out and took out his cell phone to call his ex-wife, but she appeared beside him. You've settled in quickly, Catherine said, looking at the pretty witch, that, as if wanting to bring the jealousy of the ex to the maximum, smiled wickedly, and at this moment was charming. Catherine, come on, Alexander asked. This is the daughter of my boss, or rather, not a daughter. In general, consider that this is my assistant. I see, Catherine said insulted. In everything you help you, this daughter of the boss. The smile did not leave Sophia's face. She seemed to revel in the jealousy of her rival. The surgeon felt like a complete idiot and did not know how to calm the woman. How did he used to deal with her? She started right up, didn't she? You'd think no one helps you, said the witch and winked. Kecha's face immediately turned crimson. Get out, she whispered. Get out, both of you. Catherine, what kindergarten, said the surgeon. I drove 500 kilometers. What about my father? Where is he lying? Let's go, I'll talk, I'll examine him. No, she cut off. Go away, it's too late. He never came to his senses, do you understand? It's not a judgment, Alexander replied. Tell us where he is and we'll go there. Come on. Write your witch, I love another, whispered Catherine. What? Asked the surgeon, not believing his ears. Another? Mark shrugged his ex-wife. 
The real man is not you. Alexander felt dizzy, as if Catherine had slapped him. He physically felt his skin burning. Mark, his apprentice, his former companion. What did she see in him? Thirty years old, yesterday student. Ah, how long have they been together? I wonder, Alexander thought. Okay, we're leaving, said the surgeon, surprisingly calm. And what? asked the ex-wife. You won't say anything else. Not even hit. Can I see my daughter? There is no her, giggled Catherine. No, your new girlfriend will give you another one. Or a son. Or the old one will take away, smiled Sophia. Took Alexander by the hand and took him to the car. She put him on the passenger seat and started the engine and sharply pressed the gas. Now it was clear to him. It's over. How could he live so many years with the illusion of love for this woman? Only now he realized how unpleasant Catherine was to him. Worse, indifferent, but only his daughter. How to see her? I drive normally, Sophia said, pulling out onto a busy road. You look, of course. Come on, tell me which nightclub to go to. We'll cheer you up. I don't want to go to a club, Alexander replied. Do you know Washington's well? Well, the girl shrugged her shoulders, but nobody canceled Google and Magic Alice. What, witches also use the internet? Asked the surgeon. Yeah, Sophia replied, I have an idea. That's an attic. An attic? Well, yes, said the girl. It's called a cafe. You can sit there and smoke hookah. Hookah is bad for you, said the surgeon. It kills neurons in the brain. Let's go. His heart was racing. After his ex-wife's revelations, he felt heavy. They collapsed on soft cushions and took turns inhaling smoke mixed with the aromas of flowers and fruits, and with each puff Alexander more and more accepted his situation. My daughter will grow up, he thought, and will definitely understand me, or maybe I'll take her away sooner. He didn't even notice how the witch was right next to him and snuck under his shoulder. The surgeon thought the locals were slandering her. What kind of witch is she? She's a charming girl, close at hand at such an important moment. Do you know what I dreamed last night? Alexander asked with a smile and suddenly blushed. I know. Dreams are the journey of souls. We could well be together while our mortal bodies were lying on their beds. Will you kiss me? She asked innocently and they merged in one great passion and almost unwrapped the hookah on themselves, which provoked the wrath of the receptionist. In the morning, as they were leaving the hotel, Sophia paid at the counter herself, and right from there she sent him a kiss. They traveled the road to Raznovidno in silence. The witch was smiling, and Alexander was immersed in his own thoughts. The revived manor had not gone anywhere. The gates moved, the guards jokingly saluted. That was fast, Stephen said. Give me the keys, I'll park it myself. The chief is waiting in his office. The surgeon turned around to say goodbye to the witch, but she was already gone. She literally vanished into thin air. He walked into the house, moving from the hot street to the cool of the rooms. It was as if he had been transported to another time and age. His benefactor was waiting for him in the living room, sipping green tea from a mug. How was the trip? Emmanuel's voice was filled with ill-concealed curiosity. It was fine. Decided to stay the night? Ha <laughs> ha, it's a young thing. Yes, Alexander tried to make his voice sound indifferent. You know, it was too late to go back. After all, 500 kilometers. I understand, agreed the millionaire. It's good that we return today. The project is not waiting, but you shouldn't be in a hurry either, because you're taking the gold, my gold. Alexander nodded and left. Yes, the Valenus fate continued to put its experiments on him. The surgeon remembered the morning in the hotel, how Sophia covered herself with a silk sheet with her head. Suddenly she pulled it off, sat on the bed young, beautiful, with a perfect figure, completely naked. Let's go, she said or ordered, pulling the blanket up to her shoulders. Or maybe you want to. No, he objected. 
Let's go, because your father, he's not my father. The witch shouted in a low voice, covering her mouth with her hand in shame. The blanket slipped off again, revealing her breasts. Are you sure you don't want to? I want to take a shower, Alexander smiled, though he was actually scared. The night with Sophia seemed like a dream to him. He could no longer understand what was real and what was a dream. He returned back to the living room, and the millionaire stared at him in bewilderment. And Alexander wanted to come up and touch his benefactor to make sure that he was real. Did you forget something? Mr. Am asked. No. Alexander tried to think of an excuse so that his return wouldn't seem so strange. An old general was talking to me the other day. Asked you to look around? The millionaire asked. Go at once. After all, the outpatient clinic will soon be put into operation. So why not begin to get acquainted with the patients? There was nowhere to go. The benefactor himself said to visit the general and examine him. In the manor found a good box of medical instruments. The surgeon took it rather for solidity. After all, he was not going to diagnose the first patient in this wilderness. The general's house was far away near the forest, and a guard drove him there. Alexander went to the entrance and pressed the bell. A friendly woman with sad eyes let him inside. The general was already waiting inside, and he didn't look well. A red face, on which there was a mesh of burst vessels, clearly indicated ill health. The retired military man was smiling. Would you like a drink? The old general asked as they went into the living room. No, Alexander replied. It's bad for your health. What's troubling you? Oh, Evan exhaled. I'm worried about the fate of my homeland. I am afraid that it has been taken over by either fools or blind men. And as for my health, there is a delicate problem. I don't know how to put it. Have you taken tests? The surgeon asked. Yes, the general nodded at a stack of documents. Just two days ago, I had to shake for two hours on the way to the clinic. Shaking. Alexander was surprised. The road is beautiful. The road is, but my fear of medicine has not been cancelled. The general explained. Here are the results. He pointed to a puffy folder of test results and conclusions. The surgeon began to leisurely study them, reading. Wow, how is he still alive? The papers spoke eloquently that the old general needed qualified help. Why didn't the doctor prescribe treatment for you? I don't trust him, the general replied. Because of his political views, what if he wants to poison me? And you were recommended to me as a neutral person as a man who will definitely not heal anyone. Alexander sighed. He liked this village with its strange inhabitants less and less. Listen, said the surgeon. Rarely would a doctor pay attention to the political views of a patient when prescribing treatment. That's exactly what's rare. Evan exclaimed. That's exactly the kind of doctor who works at the clinic to which we belong. Sorry, the fear medicine is wearing off. I need to repeat it. The general took a decanter with fogged walls and poured cognac into a shot glass. He armed himself with a fork to cut a slice of lemon. No, Alexander resolutely covered the shot glass with the palm of his hand. I can see that you have stones, kidney stones. You see this picture right here. They injected you with a special liquid to make it. Doesn't cognac soften them? The general was surprised. He tried to snatch the shot glass but he couldn't compete with the doctor. On the contrary, said the surgeon. This is one of the reasons for their formation. Undressed to the waist, let's examine you. Studying the patient and medical documents, Alexander thought that a man digs his own grave. For example, this retired general, Evan, he's not even 60 years old, and his body is like an old man's. His joints don't bend, his skin's all blistered, he can barely move. We should put him on a diet, cut out alcohol. Maybe we could get him back on his feet. Well, summarized Alexander, there are two options, surgical and conservative treatment. Speak to me like an idiot, Evan asked, if you would be so kind. Okay, the doctor gave in, 
or you stop eating meat in pots and drinking cognac in buckets, and then you can choose a diet, prescribe medications. Absolutely not, the general exclaimed. I'm going crazy in this wilderness. I was dismissed so unfairly and so soon. The girl covered her mouth with her hand as if she was about to say something unnecessary. Our union is approved, but not in heaven, Sophia said. And you're starting to wiggle. That's not how decent men behave. You're a decent man, I can see that. Don't lie to me. She suddenly laughed in a low voice that a girl just can't have. I'll think about it, he said and smiled, but he had goosebumps running up and down his spine. Can I be alone for a while? There was something wrong about it, something unnatural and fake. Alexander rubbed the mark Mr. M had given him. The burn was almost healed, even though it had only been a few days. I'll leave, the surgeon said to himself and started packing. After all, he hadn't signed any papers. This whole village, divergent is just collective insanity. Insanity. And it's run by a crazy millionaire. Can't you see he's not going to succeed? What does he want to accomplish? Bring back the US of a century ago. It doesn't exist. And he's just a nouveau riche, not a hereditary nobleman. And there aren't even 50 souls in his village. The surgeon went to the shower. He wanted to wash up before the road. It was getting dark, so he didn't even turn on the light in the room. Okay, but we have to go today. Suddenly he felt someone's presence. Is she back? What a witch. Who's there? Loudly asked the surgeon, approaching the light switch, I'll turn on the light. Hello, Archie whispered, from Sofka. And at the same second Alexander felt a blow in the back of his neck and bent like a bowstring. He wanted to pull the knife out, to call for help or just scream, but he couldn't. He collapsed on his side, still convulsing. That's it, Archie whispered, satisfied, turning on the light. I'll watch you while you get here because Sophia is mine, mine, do you hear? The surgeon was breathing with great difficulty. As a specialist, he understood perfectly well that the village man had inflicted a severe wound on him, and how ineptly he had done it. He could have killed him at once, then he wouldn't have had to suffer, or missed, leaving a scratch. Of all the options, he chose the most unfortunate. Alexander could remain conscious for a long time and suffer from horror and pain. Suddenly, he heard Stephen run into the room in footsteps. Hands up, he shouted. Come on. The sounds of struggling reached the weakening Alexander, and then a strange sound, as if a piece of meat had been thrown to the ground, and a terrible sigh. Archie. Doctor, said the guard, dropping to a knee beside him. Alexander saw his frightened eyes. Doctor, can we turn around? Doctor, can you hear me? Hold on, I'll save you. He said no to her. He told her no. Sophia couldn't believe it. What had she done wrong? Was her natural magic not enough to make this snob of the capital fall in love with her? She'd liked him immediately, and her benefactor hadn't dared refuse. He called her here simply because she'd asked him to. Alexander was good. On all accounts, on all cards, their union promised to be long and happy. I can only applaud, Mr. M said. Anything you say, sweet art. Well, you'll forgive me, won't you? But it all went wrong. Why was Alexander frightened? She could see the fear in his eyes. But fear is half the problem. What matters is indifference. No man she'd ever chosen for herself had ever been indifferent and Emmanuel was the first. He just didn't realize it was she who drew him to her, not him. And she was not mistaken. The penitent millionaire became something of a springboard for her. But Alexander, how good and strong he was. He probably didn't realize it himself. The doctor was a boulder. In time, their union could have been a song of ice and fire, and then the whole world would shudder. But Alexander rejected her. Such things are not forgiven, no. Anyone but her. Sophia could forgive anything but indifference. At that moment, the girl realized that the capital surgeon could not belong to anyone but her. And if he doesn't want to, well, so much the worse for a man essentially young and handsome. 
but useless. In that moment, she passed judgment on him. Would she be sorry? Of course not. In such things as love, there can be no defeat. It's either a victory or a fighting draw. Alexander woke up. He could hardly open his eyes, and at first he thought he had gone blind. Everywhere was white, the walls, the ceiling, and even the rag with which he was covered. Above him were familiar muscarons, ancient goddesses, animals. That this was not a morgue, Alexander realized by the smell. It smelled sterile and clean, which can only be in a hospital. We woke up. Three months of sleep is no joke. Everyone has already put a cross, but not me. They say you can't buy health and happiness. Ha! Yes, you can. The voice was familiar. The surgeon heard in it mixed feelings, relief, and disappointment. It was as if Alexander was someone the voice both wanted to see and hoped never to know again. Completely immobilized, he couldn't answer anything. The sensation was unlike any previous experience. The doctors claimed you would not regain consciousness, but I disagreed. How could a man under my protection leave without my consent? No, it's impossible. Alexander was silent. He tried to push air through his recalcitrant mouth so that he could make meaningful sounds, but the result was only mooing. At least he was able to breathe unaided. I wonder what his body looks like now. If the millionaire wasn't lying about the three months, the muscles must have turned into strings. Maybe speech will be restored, Mr. Am said, watching his exertions. That's it for now. By the way, blink if you can hear. Alexander obeyed. The realization of his own part came to him. Paralyzed. Turned into the broken doll he'd examined during his internship. Did he ever think he'd be in the same position? I'm not leaving you, Mr. M said eagerly. You see, the outpatient clinic came in handy. You could say you built it for yourself, couldn't you? No, really. I've had a feeling for a long time that it should be built. I could send you to Washington or even Berlin. But no, I can't. I need to be sure you're all right. The surgeon never gave up trying to ask a question. He exhaled air with his mouth, trying desperately to lift his tongue to the sky. He could feel it a little. S, S, he whispered, and only a man of true passion could make sense of it. Sophia. Emmanuel interjected. Oh, she was so ashamed. She's the one who put him up to it. You know, though. No, I did not bring her to justice. What's that gonna fix? Now we keep each other's secrets and balance them out. And you look like a tank, like a Baroque face. Mr. M was silent for a moment. I'm really sorry. But don't worry, Sophia will visit you. Read books, feed you. I'll make sure that for the rest of her, or the rest of your life, rest, doctor, and don't worry about a thing. All your troubles are behind you. Maddie and Mickey were sitting on a park bench. They were holding hands. You could see the big Maddie between them. Maddie, my, I don't believe there are feelings like that. He looked into her eyes. Barry, I'm so happy. They were together like crazy. They didn't notice anyone or anything around them. Hello, could you look at my phone? A girl walked into the cellular salon where they also provided repair services. What happened? A handsome young man came out to her. I don't know. It doesn't hold a charge at all, or I'm doing something wrong. She took the device out of her pocket. Yes, he smirked. The model was not modern at all. What? You can't fix it. The girl was upset. Unfortunately, it's just been working for a long time. That's why it doesn't hold a charge. The guy thought what he could do. Well, thank you. Thought she was left without a phone. You know, I can offer you an alternative. He went into the back. Yes, I'm listening. She liked being treated so well. Just a minute. The young man shouted. Waiting. The girl turned to the display case with phones. Yes, she certainly wanted a new and modern one, but unfortunately, she couldn't afford it. Here, finally, the guy came back. Look, the model, although not new, but will serve for a long time. What? I cannot afford to buy even the cheapest phone, 
she resented, really, if she wanted to do it, she would not have chosen it herself. No, you don't understand. You give me yours and I give you this one. He smiled. Is that how it works? She didn't believe it. Why not? The smile never left his face. I don't even know. The girl began to feel embarrassed. It's okay. Take it. He handed her the machine insistently. Thank you very much. She didn't know what else to say. What's your name? He asked her. Mady, she blushed. And I'm Mickey. He held out his hand to her. Good, she thought. The guy's going to ask for something in return for giving her such a gift. Well, what are you standing there for? You can go. The deal is done, he laughed. I don't even know how to thank you. She stood there blushing. Write down my phone number. I will not ask for yours, so that you do not think anything. But if you decide to call, I will not mind, the young man said with ease. That's it. Maddie didn't believe him. Yes, he could see how unsure the girl was. Good. Then dictate, she prepared to write it down. After Mickey said all the numbers, they said goodbye and the girl left the salon. She was walking, and her pocket was directly burning through her new cell phone. It still didn't fit in her head how you could come into a store, and they gave you something there. Mickey, did you give her the phone for nothing? A colleague asked the guy when they were alone in the store. Yes, he nodded, and took the money out of his wallet and put it in the cash register. Are you crazy? His friend laughed at him. There was indeed a promotion going on in the salon. A person could bring in his old phone and get a new one at a discount. That's how Mickey made the deal, but he paid for the purchase himself. You should have seen her. She came with a phone, with which now even grandmothers do not go, and cannot buy a new one. Even the same, the young man was responsible for his act. You are definitely not all at home, twisted his finger at the temple partner. Okay, I hope she calls me, he winked at him. You didn't even get her number. The friend was amazed at all. I think she'll want to talk to me, Mickey said confidently. Well, well, went the comrade to the back room to get something to eat. Mickey wasn't the kind of guy who was labeled a nerd or a sucker. He was a good-looking, confident young man. When he'd seen Maddie, something about her had caught his eye. And now all he could think about every day was when she'd call him. Maddie came home. She poured herself some tea, sat at the table with her new phone in front of her. She pondered whether she should dial the number she had today or not. On the one hand, what's the big deal if they go out? But on the other, what if he thinks she's frivolous? Hey, she walked into the office the next day. How's it going? A friend, and in the same person, a co-worker, asked after the greeting. I'm fine, Maddie set her bag on the desk, and put her phone down. Wow, a new one. She picked up the phone in her hands. Yeah, you won't believe it. The girl started to tell her. No way, laughed Natalie. You know I don't have any extra money. Maddie turned away because they didn't believe her. And why would I lie? Now, Natalie went on the internet and looked up these promotions. Well, what's there? Maddie thought to herself. She could look it up. That's what I was saying. There's no way. The girls read about a real discount. It turns out, Mady clamped her hand over her mouth. He seems to really like you, laughed the girlfriend. You know, he did give me his number. She opened her contact list. What about you? Natalie got curious. Nothing, I can't dare. Maddie always told the truth. I don't know. If I were you, I'd call. At that moment, the supervisor came through the door and the girls started to work. When it was lunch break, the girlfriends went out for coffee and a scone each. Now would be a good time. Natalie glanced at Maddie's phone. I can't. What am I going to tell him? She blushed. Nothing. Ask to meet tonight. And then you can talk it over. The girl taught her. Do you think so? Maddie stopped. I don't think, but I'm sure. She took the phone from her girlfriend's hands, dialed the number, and put it to Maddie's ear. There were only three or four beeps, but in that time Maddie had experienced such excitement. 
Her heart was pounding in her chest. She thought the pounding would make her unable to speak. Her mind was all jumbled up. Hello, Mickey answered. An unfamiliar number popped up on his screen. He hoped it was Maddie. Hi, it's me, she said very quietly. Maddie, he clarified, because he'd been getting calls from different unfamiliar numbers lately, and he'd asked her name from all of them. Yes, she looked at Natalie and nodded. And I thought you wouldn't call anymore, he admitted. You know, I'm a little busy right now. I'm on my lunch break, but if you don't mind, we could meet tonight, she said in a rush, because she was so shy. Sure, tell me where and I'll come, he didn't want to stress the girl. Come on, I'd better go to your salon, Maddie didn't want him to think he owed her. She always did everything herself, she wasn't used to someone helping her. Okay. I finish at six, I'll be waiting for you, I could hear him smiling. There you go, and you were afraid, it's no big deal, Natalie told her as Maddie put the phone away. She was still all red and her hands were shaking with excitement. Uff, that's the first time I've ever had that, the girl exhaled. They ate lunch, went back to work, and after that they were so loaded with work that there was no time to lift their heads. But when five o'clock struck, the girl got up from her chair, she was going home, and what she didn't have time for, she decided to finish tomorrow. Aren't you going home? Natalie asked, because it was the end of the day. And why? I'll go straight from here. Catherine is at home today with a neighbor. I'll warn her that I'll be late. Maddie looked at her friend, she did not understand this running. What about getting dressed, putting on makeup? styling her hair, taking a shower after a ball. Natalie would never go on a date like that. She needed a day to get herself in shape. We'll go out tonight, and then we'll see if it's okay to get dressed up right away. Let him see how real I am. She didn't want to show Maddie that she liked him too. Okay, do what you want, said goodbye friends, and agreed that Maddie will tell everything tomorrow. The girl stayed in the office, there was still a whole hour left before the appointed time. It was possible to finish some work, so that tomorrow there would not be such a jam. She did everything and did not notice how the time passed. Then the girl got up, went to the mirror that hung in the hallway. That's it. Don't be afraid of anything. It's okay. You're brave and you'll succeed. She looked at herself in the reflection. Maddie had never asked anyone out on a date, she had always been modest. Now here she was walking, wondering what was going to happen next. Mickey was already waiting for her at the entrance. She saw him from a distance. The excitement started to rise inside her again. Like a true woman, you're a little late, he laughed and greeted Mai. You could see the guy was relaxed. He wasn't worried or embarrassed. Sorry, she was very embarrassed, so she spoke one wordedly. That's okay. Let's go, he beckoned her to follow him. Where to? She wasn't going somewhere specific because she wasn't ready for that. Just for a walk, why are you so scared? He realized that it was the first time she was in such a situation. No, just, I can't stay long. She didn't say the reason why she needed to go home early. Okay, a couple hours and I'll walk you out, he promised her. Okay, walked the girl next to him. Why did you call anyway? He asked her. I found out that you cheated on me, and I couldn't help but call. She was telling the truth again, because she didn't want to lie from the beginning. Well, I'm sorry, I hope you're not giving up that phone, he realized. Of course not, but I'm going to pay you back, Maddie looked at him. Oh, here we go, everyone's so decent, Mickey laughed. They reached the cafe. The guy suggested they go in there. Maddie didn't want to at first, but then agreed one cup of tea wouldn't do her any harm. Champagne. They sat down at a table, and the young man asked the girl. What are you doing? She made big eyes. What's the big deal? I'm next to a pretty girl. Why not? He did not understand why she so refuses everything. Okay, I can have some, she agreed, but she thought she was on a roll tonight. Mickey ordered. He wanted to get the moon out of the sky for her. He liked her so much. But the boy could see that Maddie was still undecided. 
When the sparkling wine arrived, he poured it into glasses. Maddie, I want us to be together forever. He raised his glass. Jesus, Mickey, you've made up your mind so fast. The girl blushed to the tips of her ears. When I saw you, I realized that this is my destiny, he said frankly. Okay, give me time to think. She took a sip. Gas bubbles hit her nose. Not at all mind, he told many funny stories. The girl relaxed, further the evening passed more quietly. Mady kept looking at her watch. I hope you will not run away today, leaving me a shoe, laughed the guy. I don't get it. What are you talking about? Mady looked at him surprised. About Cinderella, she, when she came to the ball, also all the time looked at the clock and then took and left the prince without saying a word to him. He retold the plot of the fairy tale. So you are a prince, smiled the girl. Anything is possible. He took the champagne and poured more. I have to go. She looked at the time again. Let's go. He did not persuade her because he realized that they had many happy days ahead of them. They went outside. It was nice to walk down the quiet streets, just the two of them. Maddie wondered how the young man would react when she told him about the baby. When the young people reached the house where the girl lived, they simply said goodbye. Will we meet tomorrow? Mickey asked. He wanted it so badly, and he wished she would reciprocate. I don't know. I have a lot of things to do. She was telling the truth because she couldn't leave her daughter with her neighbor every night. You are so modest and secretive, but I even like it. He took her hand and looked into her eyes. That's it, I have to go. Maddie turned around and walked into the entryway. She didn't want anything to happen between them tonight. Bye, the guy said when she was no longer outside and the entryway door closed. Mickey went home. He didn't know why the girl was so uncooperative. At some point he stopped, he thought, what if she had a husband or just a boyfriend she didn't want to talk about? But at the same time he did not believe it, because such a modest girl could not walk left and right. The young man somehow waited for the next day, when it was lunch break, he dialed Maddie's number. Earlier, he just did not dare to bother her. He was afraid that she had a lot of work, and she might be offended. How's my modest girl doing? He asked her when she answered. Hi, she was embarrassed again. Good thing he couldn't see it. If you can't tonight, maybe you and I could meet up now and have coffee. The guy didn't even ask, he asserted. Okay, she quickly agreed, because she didn't want to discuss it in front of everyone. He waited for her at the exit of the building, and then they went to the cafeteria that was nearby. Mickey did what a real man should do all the time. He opened the door in front of Maddie when they got to a table, pulled back a chair, and then placed their order. What will you have? He asked the girl before he did. A cappuccino, she replied. Maddie really liked that drink, but lately she had to make do at home with a simple instant one because she didn't have any extra money. Now. He held up his hand for the waiter to approach them. You're so. Na raised her eyes at him. What kind? Laughed the young man. I don't know, attentive. She picked up her napkin and now focused all her attention on it. Maddie, I've already told you that I like you and I'd like to start dating you. He repeated again what he said a day ago. Okay, there's just one thing you need to know. The girl got excited. Are you married? Immediately, he made the assumption that tormented him the most. No, I would have confessed right away, she laughed. I don't care about the rest, he breathed a sigh of relief. By now dinner was coming to an end. Mickey, I can't go out with you tonight. Come and visit us. With these words, they walked to the steps of the organization where Maddie worked. I'll be there at seven o'clock then. He was very thoughtful. The guy went to work and thought to himself why she said to us, who she lives with, probably that's what she wanted to talk about. But in the end, the guy decided that today everything would become clear and he wouldn't have to think and guess anymore. Maddie didn't stay late today. She left home on time. There were still a lot of things to prepare. On the way, she went to the store, 
Bought the essentials. No frills. Aunt Sveta, good evening. She knocked on the neighbor's door where her daughter was. Come in. Now we'll drink tea and talk. Welcomed her woman. No, I have no time today. Ekaterina, let's go home, she called the girl. Well, well, then next time, upset neighbor. Sorry, Maddie in front of her was also ashamed, stits constantly with her child, and she cannot even talk to her. They entered the apartment. There the girl immediately went to the kitchen, put the kettle on. She still had to change. Mummy, is someone coming to see us? There was a little girl standing in the hallway. Yes, a very nice uncle, she told her. Is he my daddy? The girl had never met him. No, but maybe he will be. The mother hugged her daughter. What's his name? The little girl asked. Mickey, her mom smiled back at her. Like a cat, Catherine laughed then. Oh, you can't say that. Her mother wagged her finger. Well, in front of him will not say, promised her daughter. Well done, they hugged. And after that they went to the kitchen, where Maddie boiled oliverones, printed stew, fried everything. At that moment, there was a knock at the door. Now, shouted the hostess, and went to the door. Is that him? Catherine made big eyes. It must be, her mother whispered to her. Maddie opened the doors, there was indeed Mickey. He stood with a bouquet of flowers, which he immediately gave to the girl. Hi, he smiled. Come in. She walked through the apartment so Mickey could come in. Oh, who's this here? He saw the girl and swatted down. Hello. The little girl came up to him. What's your name? Looked at the hostess, as if looking for support from her. Catherine, answered the girl. And me. He held out his hand to her but he didn't have time to say her name. I know Mickey. She smiled a sincere childish smile. Yeah, did mom tell you yet? He got to his feet. Of course, she and I were just talking. I also told her that you have a name like. Maddie realized what was about to happen. Okay, let's go to the kitchen, she said quickly. And I brought the cake, pulled out of the bag the young man wrapped. Yay, shouted Catherine. They all walked together to the kitchen, then Maddie made tea, then sliced the cake. Mickey sat looking around. Are you renting an apartment? He guessed, because it was a bit of a mess. Yeah, she nodded. I see, me too. He was quiet for a while. Catherine, go to the room, Uncle Mickey, and I need to talk, her mother asked her. Right away, she took her plate of cake and tea. Why didn't you tell me right away? Mickey asked immediately. Why, do you mind? Maddie understood. Not many men want to date a girl who has a child. On the contrary, I'm all for it. He took her hand in his. You're not cheating. Maddie glanced down at him. Of course not, as they say. There are no other people's children, smiled the young man. Okay, sighed the girl. She didn't want to talk about it much. What okay? I offer her my strong male shoulder, and she's okay, as if offended by Mickey. They sat for a little while longer, and then the young man started to get ready to go home. Are you leaving already? Catherine looked out of the room. Yes, everyone has to work tomorrow. We have to go to bed, he said, and then he looked at Maddie. Don't worry, everything will be fine, he told her. The next day they had coffee together again at lunchtime, and in the evening they went for a walk together. Catherine was with them. After the young man called, came, helped to do something in the apartment. Going to cafes in the afternoon became a ritual, and in three weeks Mickey and Maddie were already deciding who they would go to live with, him or her. It didn't matter, both apartments were rented. She held his hands and couldn't believe that such feelings could exist not only in the movies, but in reality. You see, it happens, he kissed her back. They lived together. Catherine Mickey took Mickey as his own. Everything was very good. They were both working, bringing income into the family. Things were starting to happen. You never told me about Ketia's dad, Mickey asked her. There was nothing to tell about him, as long as he was comfortable. Everything was, 
and as soon as we stopped satisfying him, he disappeared. The girl smiled sadly. She remembered how she'd met the scoundrel. When she needed him, he idolized her. And then Maddie found out that she was expecting a child. Then her husband told her that he had found someone else and was leaving for her. You see, he's too young to raise kids. She clipped his wings. Were you married? He saw that she went along with him. Yes, not for long, six months only, sighed Maddie. How much it hurt her then, she can't even convey it. Okay, let's not talk about it. Mickey hugged the girl, not to give her a reason to remember. After that, the young man made a decision that he would definitely, in a short time, make her an offer. He wanted to do everything for the sake of these two people for whom he now took responsibility. Natalie asked her at work, she was interested in everything. It's very good, it doesn't seem real, like a movie, Maddie said, while she was thinking about something. So enjoy it, before this one runs away, advised her friend, she knew what the girl had in the past. No, this one won't run away, he's going to propose, Maddie said dreamily. What about you? Natalie wondered. And I don't need it, what's the hurry? especially since I've already been there. I know that there's nothing to do in marriage. The girl looked out the window. They gossiped all day, but they didn't agree on anything. Maddie went home. The people she loved were waiting for her there. There was no need for any distractions now. So after the end of the workday, the only way to go was to her home. Mickey, why don't you ever talk about your relatives? Maddie asked him in the evening. What's there to tell about them? He shrugged. I don't know. Anything. Who do you have? Mom, Dad. She tried to get him to talk. No one, he mumbled, and it was obvious that he was very concerned about the subject. Good, she did not pester. She saw that the young man did not want to talk on the subject. In the morning, Maddie got up, began to get ready for work, suddenly, dizzy, sat back down on the bed sat like that for a few minutes. What's the matter with you? Mickey was concerned. He always noticed when his wife wasn't feeling well. I don't know. I guess I got up abruptly. She got up again, went to the kitchen, and drank a glass of water. Came to work, still felt bad. She didn't realize what it could be. It was like a little poisoning, but Maddie couldn't remember what she had eaten yesterday. Your face was gone, like you've been out all night celebrating, her friend told her, as she knew how it felt. I feel dizzy, dizzy, admitted the girl. And what? You're not on hold by any chance. Natalie snickered. What? I realized what her friend was hinting at. The same thing, she looked at Maddie's belly. No, she thought for a moment. No, 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 no. Come on, babies are a blessing. Her co-worker didn't understand. Where are you going? She looked scared. That evening at home with Mickey, they had a serious talk. She didn't want children. One child was enough for her. The young man didn't think so. He wanted, oh, how he wanted, about what he told his beloved. My Lubushka, he hugged her. Tomorrow we go to the registry office. You only about one thing, almost cried the girl, but agreed, because she was not going to have an abortion. After they filed an application and the day was appointed, Maddie went to the hospital, got on the register. It was so bad she didn't know what to do. She felt nauseous and dizzy all the time. Be patient, it's not much longer. Mickey supported her in everything. The wedding was played modestly. The girl did not want to see anyone. She asked her fiance to invite only the closest people and he did so. That's good. Her stomach was reacting to everything. But I promise you that I'll give you a big celebration. Mom and baby were healthy. So they were discharged from the hospital a few days later. How amazed was the young mom when after discharge they arrived home and that everything was already ready to meet the little resident. Mommy, and where did you get it? Little Katusha was very curious when the woman returned not alone. Little girl, I'll explain everything to you later, Maddie promised her, because now she wanted to put the baby to bed and get some rest herself. And can I rock him? Asked the girl, 
when the brother was put in the crib. How's Tony doing? Mickey asked when Maddie came into the room. He's fine. She sat down next to her husband tiredly. You have no idea how happy I am. He kissed her. I love you. She looked at Mickey. I love you. He kissed her face again and again. After that, all day long after that, Maddie was busy. In the morning, she would pack up the little one to take Katia to daycare. After that, home, cleaning, cooking, and then back to daycare in the evening. Yes, it was hard, but on the other hand, she realized that it wasn't easy for Barry either. Did you buy a cake? She called her husband. Today, Nikita was one year old. She wanted a little celebration, not even for herself, but for the kids. Sure, I'll be right there. Mickey answered her. He stopped by the store after work, bought a cake and a present for his son and daughter. Catherine, lay out the spoons and I'll pour the tea. Now daddy will be here, Maddie told her daughter. Now, she was glad when her mother asked her for help. Here I am. A man came into the apartment. Yay, daddy's here. Catherine ran towards him, followed by her little brother. Let's go to the table called the Mickey. Look what I bought you here. Why so much? Money has nowhere to go. Saw that her husband brought a lot of unnecessary things from the store. It's a holiday, he wondered, so he could make the kids happy sometime. Maddie knew that her husband loved to bring gifts like that, even for her. Yes, it was joyful, but there were times when there was simply no bread to buy. The family, as on other holidays, did not invite anyone because the guests would have to be treated, and not with what. Why didn't you at least invite Natalie? Mickey often asked. Don't ask, she looked away. Catherine was in first grade, Tony was getting older, Maddie wanted to go back to work after her maternity leave. That's it, a couple more months, and we'll get day care, she told her husband. That's good, he cheered. That afternoon, Maddie went to work to tell them she was leaving. The first thing she did was look in her friend's office. Hi, she opened the door. Oh, what people haven't seen you in ages, stood up and walked over to Maddie. How are you? I wanted to ask her. She hadn't been here in a long time. Fine. Natalie looked back at the new girls. Oh, let me get you a drink. It's stuffy in here. Maddie sat down on a chair. She felt sick. Natalie turned away to pour liquid into a glass when she heard a thud. She crouched over Maddie, but she didn't wait for an answer and called an ambulance. The doctors arrived. The girl had already regained consciousness, but they still took her with them to examine her. At the hospital, they put her on an IV. Doctor, when will they let me go home? She asked, because Catherine was there alone with little Tony. Soon, be patient. I don't believe in all these omens. As soon as she thought that everything would start all over again, she just started to vomit. I'll help you with everything, Mickey promised. There was no doubt in Maddie's mind that it was her husband who had caused this unplanned pregnancy. No matter how hard she braced herself and talked about abortion, she knew there was nothing she could do. This time it went much easier than with Tony. Natalie when she came to check on her friend's health, was a little shocked by the news. Well, you're crazy, friend. I won't get married. I won't give birth. And you? She laughed at her. Well, stop it. It's sickening without you, Maddie asked her. Come on, may you be well. I wish you happiness. The girls hugged each other. Natalie left and Maddie was left to sit with her thoughts. How they would last? Yes, Mickey earns money, but it's so little that even now it's not enough, and then, but it was too late to think, the term was decent, it was only necessary to wait for the time when it will be necessary to give birth. Maddie kept thinking about how they would be with the little one. She told Mickey to go to the hospital early, because she was afraid that it might happen again like last time. Whatever you say, Catherine will look after Tony while I'm away the father of the family said. But it was not scary, because the man worked at night. Yes, she was good, responsible. Although the girl was still small, she did everything to ease her mother's worries. 
Maddie herself went to the hospital, did not ask anyone. Then before the deadline set by the doctors, there was still a week, but the woman was afraid something might go wrong. Hello, she was met, put in the room, now she could not worry about anything, because if something starts, the doctors are always there. I'm so scared, said one of the girls who was lying here on the ward. What kind of pregnancy are you having? Maddie asked her. At first, she looked at her. I'm on my third, and I'm still scared, she told her. It's already known what's going on. Her roommate didn't understand. No one knows how everything will go, and more afraid for the future. Not for today, complained Maddie. Oh, what is there in the future? Everything will be fine. The girl believed in it, because she was young and had not yet faced the difficulties that exist in life. They didn't talk anymore, each thinking about her own. Maddie was imagining all the diaper rasping that had bored her lately, and now consider it a new circle. Staying up at night, getting up to the baby, potty, pacifier, she didn't even want to think about it. Labor began early. The doctors praised the woman that she came early. Now there was no need to hurry anywhere. She was quietly transferred to the ward, and there, without any nerves and hurry, all the procedures were done. She screamed. This time it hurt a lot. The last time it had also hurt a lot, but now it seemed to be several times worse. It's okay. Breathe. The midwife commanded her. I can't. It hurts. Maddie strained. Now, now. The doctor saw the head already. Maddie pushed once more, and her next daughter was born. She lay there without strength and did not understand what was going on around her. Yes, the midwife said, and put the girl on her mother's chest. Aurora, her mother looked at her. A fitting name, laughed those around them who were here. Mickey didn't have time this time he was working, but when Maddie called him, he immediately rushed over to the maternity ward. I love you. Thank you for my daughter, he shouted to her. And she just put her palm to her lips and sent him an air kiss. Her husband at that moment pretended to catch it and press it to his heart, and then they were driving home again. Promise that we won't have any more children, Maddie begged Mickey. She even wanted to get her tubes tied, but was afraid of the consequences. I promise, he admired his daughter, who was in his arms at that moment. Home came, all of what had once been Nicky Timo's was now his baby sister's. Crib, stroller, diapers, Bonnets, rattles, everything, everything. He gave it to her. You're my good one. Couldn't mommy just look at it? Everything was fine at first. Nothing needed to be bought for Aurora. Practically everything was there. Maddie was glad that the finances were starting to be enough. Albeit, they also couldn't afford the extra, but it was easier than before. I'm going to work, Mickey said, which he did every night. Good rocked his wife to their youngest daughter, who was almost a year old. She heard the door slam, went to the room, but the slamming sounded again. Forgot to take my phone, the man said. Why don't you look in the mirror, Maddie told him. No time, he waved his hand. Oh, Mickey, God forbid, Maddie said, as she looked at the phone. Hello, she looked at her watch, it was half past four in the morning. Hello, Maddie. A man's voice asked her a question. Yes, what's wrong? Her heart was pounding in her chest. Is Mickey your husband? The same voice asked. Yes, tears were already in her eyes and her voice was shaking. He had a very serious accident today. He is in the hospital now. If you leave the house right now, you may still have time. He disconnected the phone. Catherine, Catherine, please look after the little ones. I went. The mother was thrashing around the apartment. What happened? The girl couldn't understand in her sleep. I'll come back and tell you everything, her mother told her. She could not call anyone for a long time, and when the car finally arrived, Maidie did not count on anything. Where's my husband? I'm Maidie. She shouted at the whole ward. Quickly here, one of the girls in a white coat called out to her. Maddie, her husband looked at her, and leaned back. Mickey, I love you. Don't go. Don't leave me. 
She was getting hysterical, but her husband couldn't hear her. Calm down, they gave her some kind of sedative, but nothing could help Maddie now. The woman was inconsolable. She didn't know how to go on. They brought her home. The Barry was gone, and she knew it. Mom, what about Dad? Catherine asked her, but she could not answer her because she was like crazy. Everything helped to do friends and colleagues in the work of men. How can I now? Fell a woman on the body of her dead husband, but no one could no longer answer her. Maddie, calm down. Natalie tried to support her. Everyone understood why the woman was killing herself. After the funeral and the wake, she sat in the kitchen, staring blankly at the wall. Mummy, the children want to eat. Catherine came up to her. My darling, how are we going to be now? Maddie realized that she had babies. She couldn't go to work yet, and she had no money. The rent was paid for several months in advance, and then what? Maddie pulled herself together and went to Social Security. She told them about her problem, and they promised to help her. She could get some clothes or something, but it wasn't enough. Maddie, the social worker called her in the morning. We found a small house in the city. You can go there. Thank you. The woman realized that was the least she could do. She packed up the kids, and they moved in. Next, Mady went to the Department of Education to ask for a place in a kindergarten. The option they offered was an overnight facility. If you agree, you can give the boy right now, but there is no place for the younger girl yet. You will have to wait, the specialist explained to her. Okay, I agree, she thought. It will be easier this way anyway. Mom, I will not wear this. Catherine pointed to some rags that her mother said to wear to school. My dear, think about it. We have nothing now, and we should be happy with what we have. Maddie hugged her eldest daughter. While they were arguing about who would wear what, there was a knock on the door. Who is it? The woman looked at Katya. How should I know? She shrugged. When Maddie opened, she saw the woman. She was unfamiliar to her. You don't know me, but I want to help you. I heard what situation you had, and here, I brought you. She pointed at the bag with things. Thank you. Come in. The landlady let the neighbor into the house. My daughter's things are there. She's grown up now, but they'll be just right for you. She looked at Katya. Can I look at it? Asked the girl. She was still a little girl, but she understood a lot. Yes, of course, she nodded. The girl went to the bag, opened it. There were really good things, which she immediately began to try on. Thanks again, looked Maddie and the neighbor at all of this. You what? Anyone could be in this situation. She touched her arm. You come on in. Maddie really was grateful to her. Okay, sure. See you later. She looked at the landlady and walked out. I'm going to school, Catherine said, took her bag and left. Her mother stayed at home. Little Aurora was asleep. She could do things. She washed the floors, did the laundry, cooked. In the evening, when her daughter returned from school, the house was very quiet. How Tony is missed, the girl said sadly. Nothing. Let's hope that everything will get better, sighed the mother heavily. Now in the morning, when Catherine left, Maddie did things, and then sat Aurora in the stroller, and with her they went for a walk. One day they were sitting in the park and a woman came up to them. You're Maddie, aren't you? She asked her. Yes, she wondered how all these people knew her, since they didn't live very far away. Your story is all over the neighborhood, she explained. What's your name? She had to get acquainted. She couldn't just talk to everyone and not know their names. Casey, she introduced herself. Nice to meet you. Maddie didn't know what she wanted from her, but she wasn't mean in appearance. There's a church not far from here, so you should go and pray, go to a service. It might make you feel better, Casey advised her. I've never been there, Maddie told her. Are you baptized? The woman asked her. Yes, she nodded her head. All the more reason to go, Cassie insisted. All right, I'll think about it, Maddie promised her. You know what a good father we have, you talk to him. Everything will get better right away. 
the woman kept telling her. Thank you. Mady had said that word so many times lately that she was beginning to think it was all she was saying. You're welcome. Casey got up from the bench and walked away. Maddie sat and thought about her words. What if she really went to church? What did she have to lose? Maybe up there in heaven they would hear her and help her. With these thoughts the woman returned home. At the weekend Tony was taken from the kindergarten. How happy everyone was to see him, but he missed him very much. My darling, his mother and sister hugged him. Are you going somewhere? Catherine saw that her mother wore a long skirt and a scarf. I want to go to church, the woman said honestly. Okay. The girl didn't discourage her. She would play with her younger brother and sister for now. Maddie walked on, and she didn't know what would come out of it, but she believed that nothing comes easy. As she approached the building, she saw everyone stop and baptize in front of the entrance. She did the same. She went in. Inside smelled of candles and incense. The woman got dizzy, and in the first minutes, she almost fainted. Are you ill? One of the women in black took her under her arm. I'm fine, probably out of habit. She walked on, looking at the walls, the ceiling. There were a lot of icons here that Maddie didn't know anything about. She turned back to the woman who had just helped her. Yes, the woman turned to her. Could you help me? I don't know anything here, the woman asked. Yes, of course, she took her still under her arm and led her inside, explaining where to put the candles, where and to whom to pray. Thank you, Mady thanked her. You're welcome, and better yet, after it's all over, go to the bishop, talk to him. Another told her the same thing the woman in the park had told her. Maddie did as she was told, then the service began. It was hard from the get-go. And when it was finally over, the woman went to the one who had been talking and reciting prayers the whole time. Could I talk to you? She waited until the man was free. Of course, he held out his hand to her. They went to a corner and Maddie told her story briefly. Yeah, it's a mess, but don't despair. It can be fixed. He crossed himself. You can't fix it. You can't bring a man back, she cried. No need to cry. He touched her hand. And what can I do? There's only one thing to do. She didn't finish. You what? You can't even think about it. It's a big sin. Think about your children. He crossed himself again. Thank you for talking to me. She looked up at him. You know what? If you think about it, you can come to our church and here we'll get you settled. The bishop offered her. Really? She couldn't believe it. Why not? He stepped a short distance away from her, raised his hand, and made a big cross in the air, and then turned around and went to his place. After church, when the woman came out of it, there was a kind of lightness inside. She was not walking, but as if she were flying through the air. How was the trip? Her daughter greeted her on the doorstep. Everything was fine, Maddie thought, whether to talk to Katia or make a decision herself. In the evening, when the younger ones were asleep, she called her daughter into the kitchen and told her everything. Mom, do you want to go to the convent? The girl was scared. She was small, apparently, so she associated the woman in the church with a nun. No, it's just that they offer us a kind of asylum there, school, food, clothes, and everything else, Maddie began to tell. I don't know. Catherine thought about the fact that she had to change schools already. Well, we will not hurry with this question. We still have time to think, agreed with her mother. When the conversation was over, they both went to bed because it was already very late. In the morning, Maddie was going to church again, but not alone, but taking the children with her. Are you ready to go to a place where it's beautiful? The mother asked the children at breakfast. Yes, they shouted in unison. Then let's eat now and get ready. The woman was sure they would like it there. When everyone was ready and about to leave the house, there was a knock at the door. Visitors again. Mom turned to Catherine. This meant she needed to entice Tony and Aurora to come over this time. The woman opened the doors. An unfamiliar man stood behind them. Hello, 
She nodded at him and looked to see if anyone else was with him. I managed to find you. He smiled back. What did you want? The woman couldn't understand. Here, Mickey told me to give this to you. But only if he is not young, he held out the envelope, which was already yellow from old age. You're not confusing anything. Mady asked. No, goodbye. He turned and strode toward the gate. Betty, hurry. Hide in the cellar, were the last words the mother shouted to her daughter from the street. The girl was 17 years old. She was very much afraid that this would happen, and it did. Their village stood practically on the outskirts, and all its inhabitants hoped that the Germans would not come to them. But in vain, because those were coming, and on their way did not spare anyone. She ducked into the cellar, closed the hatch behind her, and now sat there without moving. Betty did not know how much time had passed. She heard only explosions and terrible screams. At some point, she decided to get farther away so that no one would find her for sure. Betty woke up. She listened. Everything was quiet. The girl wanted to count how long she had been here, but she couldn't do it. There was nothing to orient herself on. She opened the cellar lid, looked out. There was a hole in the wall of the house where she had lived all her life. Anybody there? She asked in a hoarse voice. No one answered her. Betty crawled quietly to the door. She wanted to see what was going on outside and if anyone was still alive. Mama, she whispered, but even now it was quiet. Only the howling of dogs coming from the street. She would have stopped and stayed here but curiosity got the better of her. When the girl was on the street, she stood on her knees like that. She didn't want to get up. It was scary. Betty crawled. She saw that many houses were burned. In some places, people were lying down. And in the distance, she could see and hear that someone was talking loudly. The girl crouched down even lower. God help her, she whispered and crossed herself. Suddenly, in the distance, she saw someone moving and immediately rushed there. When she crawled up, she saw a young man lying wounded. At first, she did not realize that he was not her own, for he was wrapped in the usual rags and shawls worn by many in the village. She decided that whatever it was, she would save him, dragging him along with her. Come on, sweetie, give me a hand. They were almost to the house. She dragged him to that very cellar. Now the challenge was how to get him down there without breaking his neck. And then Betty remembered that there was a pile of sacks lying where they used to keep a lot of potatoes. She bent him over so that half his body was inside. And then she quickly went down into the cellar and laid him on the sacks by the shoulders. That's it. No one can get us now. She closed the lid. As the girl crawled through the house, she took matches to light the kerosene that was inside. Now there was light here, albeit a little, but still. The girl crawled up to the fighter, but as soon as she began to unwind the rags he was wearing, she recoiled. It was the enemy. For a while Betty sat back, not knowing what to do, but, after thinking it was the same man, also wounded, she crawled back to him. After examining the soldier, Betty saw that he was wounded in the stomach, but the bullet had gone through and he was alive. Risking her life, she went back up to the house, got some water and rags. She threw down a straw mat to sleep on. Now she bandaged him up, laid him on the bed, moistened her lips with water. Now I'll cook something to eat, she said. There were various preparations on the shelves, including stew that had been put aside for a rainy day. She printed it out, tasted it, and smeared grease on the soldier's lips. He coughed. Come to your senses, she asked him. The girl was scared here alone, and here, even if it was the enemy, she was not alone. Who are you? He asked, when he woke up a little and looked around. I don't understand you, Betty smiled at him. The soldier exhaled. He understood what the Russians had, but there was nothing he could do. Where are we? He spoke again. Fear was in his eyes. Still do not understand, but you do not be afraid. Everything is fine. She wanted to stroke his cheek, but he took his head away. It had been a long time, more than a day. Betty fed her rescue. Then they went to bed. 
They communicated mostly in gestures. The girl had climbed out more than once, and Ivo, as he introduced himself to her, if she understood correctly, couldn't do it. Look what I found, she brought different things. It was very scary at first, but then not so much anymore. Dank, he looked at the strange girl and was now already smiling at her. Good, she nodded her head and smiled back at the guy. Come here, he gestured to the girl. What? She came over. Beautiful, he said with a great accent. Thank you, she blushed. She too liked this handsome, non-Russian young man. After that he drew her to him and kissed her. It was the first time with Betty, so she immediately recoiled from him. But he only laughed and again pulled her by the hand to himself. The girl thought that he would not do anything to her here, for she could escape at any moment. You were good, she showed him. Beautiful. Again he repeated the word he had evidently known before. After that, Betty stopped resisting. There were no more explosions and screams outside, and the young people were still in the cellar. The girl ran about the village, running into houses where no one was already there, looking for provisions and other things she would find. Ivo was fully well by now. Somehow he showed Betty that he could get out of the cellar by himself. He put on what he had and went out of the house. Where are you going? She held out her arms to him. See here, he waved to her. She sat down on the bench and cried, realizing that it was all her own fault, but there was nothing she could do. Threw down a straw mat to sleep on. Now she bandaged him up, laid him on the bed, moistened her lips with water. Now I'll cook something to eat, she said. There were various preparations on the shelves, including stew that had been put aside for a rainy day. She printed it out, tasted it, and smeared grease on the soldier's lips. He coughed. Come to your senses, she asked him. The girl was scared here alone, and here, even if it was the enemy, she was not alone. Who are you? He asked, when he woke up a little and looked around. I don't understand you, Betty smiled at him. The soldier exhaled. He understood what the Russians had, but there was nothing he could do. Where are we? He spoke again. Fear was in his eyes. Still do not understand, but you do not be afraid. Everything is fine. She wanted to stroke his cheek, but he took his head away. It had been a long time, more than a day. Betty fed her rescued. Then they went to bed. They communicated mostly in gestures. The girl had climbed out more than once, and Ivo, as he introduced himself to her, if she understood correctly, couldn't do it. Look what I found, she brought different things. It was very scary at first, but then not so much anymore. Dank, he looked at the strange girl and was now already smiling at her. Good, she nodded her head and smiled back at the guy. Come here, he gestured to the girl. What? She came over. Beautiful, he said with a great accent. Thank you, she blushed. She too liked this handsome, non-Russian young man. After that he drew her to him and kissed her. It was the first time with Betty, so she immediately recoiled from him. But he only laughed and again pulled her by the hand to himself. The girl thought that he would not do anything to her here, for she could escape at any moment. You are good, she showed him. Beautiful, again he repeated the word he had evidently known before. After that, Betty stopped resisting. There were no more explosions and screams outside, and the young people were still in the cellar. The girl ran about the village, running into houses where no one was already there, looking for provisions and other things she would find. Ivo was fully well by now. Somehow he showed Betty that he could get out of the cellar by himself. He put on what he had and went out of the house. Where are you going? She held out her arms to him. See yo, he waved to her. She sat down on the bench and cried, realizing that it was all her own fault, but there was nothing she could do. The girl never left. She stayed in the village and began to rebuild the house. The war was coming to an end. The men began to return. Oliver came to his native village and did not recognize it. So it had changed. Almost no whole building was left. 
then others began to pull up as well. Hello. Betty heard someone say hello to her. Hello, Oliver, she answered him. Betty? He couldn't believe his eyes. You didn't recognize her. She was smiling. We're there. I was leaving. She was like this. He showed her small stature. Time was running out. She turned away. Can I come in? The man asked. Of course, she went into the house herself. They've done a lot of housekeeping. Oliver sat down at the table. Yes, Betty remembered Ivo right away. How did you stay here? He couldn't understand. Here. She waved her hands and said nothing more. Anything? He looked around the house. Practically nothing. She shook her head. Okay. He realized how difficult it would be for everyone. Now, she went into the cellar, where there was still some salt or stew she did not know. Master, you need to go to the house. He looked at the hole in the wall, which the girl fixed with what she could. No argument. She put everything on the table. How do you like my person? He did not wait for anything, but went straight to the attack. Oliver, she blushed. What's wrong? He didn't understand. I can't promise you anything. She pulled her dress over her stomach. It was already bulging a little. Wow, we were fighting back, and you're here. He pressed his lips together. Go away, she almost cried. Okay, if you tell me everything, it'll be okay. He held out his hand to her. And then Betty told him the story that had happened to her. She cried almost the whole time. The man showed his fist to the invisible enemy. Do not be angry, not nice, so go on. The girl did not want anything from him. It's all right, but in the village you cannot stay. As soon as the baby is born, you must leave immediately, said Oliver. And even better, leave now. They did not decide anything for a long time, took their modest belongings, and went to the neighboring village. They stayed there for a few days, and with their grandfather, they traveled by wagon to a place where no one knew them. Here we'll live, we moved into an empty house on the outskirts. Betty realized that this man had saved her from shame. Well then, we must have a wedding, Oliver said cheerfully. What will people say? Betty looked at him. We did not have time before the war, and there is no way, so now they decided to make a holiday. He said that they would answer to their fellow villagers. Good. The girl hugged him. Then we can invite, and we will prepare. It was decided that the victory day will be celebrated, and the wedding will be timed here. All the residents brought what they had from home. It was fun. No one even asked questions, so Betty relaxed. Oliver was willing to do anything for his wife. He never reproached her for anything. Oh, oh, oh. She clutched her stomach. Now, love, ran Oliver out of the house, he ran to the local grandmother midwife to bring her home. Water, rags, she commanded at their house. The man was very worried. He did everything he was told, and after a while the cry of their son was heard in the house. Kolka was born, the happy father threw his hat up. It's a bit early, how long has it been since the wedding? The grandmother came out of the house. It's none of your business, the man said to her. But even from this village they had to leave when they started to talk. And let them talk. The girl did not want to leave the place she had already settled. No, that's not right. Oliver shook his head. And in the other village they were well received. Here no one knew anything. No deadlines were not counted. So they began to live quietly. Oliver got a job. Betty also wanted to work, but the man said she should raise her son first. Harvey is mine, his mother stroked him on the head. He was very much like his father, which made him very sad. What are you doing? Oliver came home, and there was always a hot lunch or dinner waiting for him on the table. He appreciated his wife for that. She had time to take care of the baby and do everything for him. Nothing here, I sing psalms, said Betty. Well done, her husband came up to her and hugged her. How good it was that you came back in time, Betty always said. She realized what she owed to this man. Harvey was growing up. He was already running around the yard, chasing cats. 
his mother only had time to watch that he did not fall and did not tear his knees. Betty, don't you want to work at the post office? A neighbor asked her. Yes, she would go anywhere now. She couldn't stay at home any longer. Good, then come tomorrow. There will be waiting for you, the woman told her. Thank you. She went to the local kindergarten to get Harvey accepted there. With a bit of effort, she agreed with the head. Now her son had to go to the kindergarten. Now both husband and wife worked. The boy went to the kindergarten. The years went by. There was a real family. Wow, time flies, Oliver said, when Betty collected the boy in the first grade. Yes, it does, she sighed. The boy liked to learn. He was very inquisitive. But when he was in fifth grade, there was an accident. Betty, there's a fire in the stables. A neighbor shouted and ran to the house in the evening. What can I do? She didn't understand, but got ready to run to the scene. There's your Oliver. It's bad, screamed the woman. Betty knew that her husband would rush to the rescue of any living soul, and here were horses. She ran as fast as she could. There were many people near the stables. Betty, he's here, one of the men shouted. Now, she was making her way through a dense wall of people who were shouting. There, he pointed. Betty looked where the man was pointing, and there the beams of the ceiling were starting to collapse. No, she screamed. Someone rushed inside, but Oliver was dragged out alive. How could it be? Someone nearby wailed. Did anyone call a doctor? The neighbor, Betty, asked. Now, but there's probably nothing we can do. The chairman shushed everyone. The doctor confirmed that Oliver had smoke inhalation and was crushed by a beam. Betty just sobbed and smeared her tears on her cheeks. And then there was the funeral and everyone was here and it was sad. Isn't daddy coming back? Harvey asked mommy. No, honey, we'll have to live alone. She held him close. Now I will be the main helper in the house. Harvey hit himself in the chest. He would never give his mother an offense. He saw how all his life for her father did everything. Of course, Native, as usual, spent his mother in his hair and had to live like that, the two of them, to do everything themselves to make their way. The son promised and kept his word. He did everything around the house, never slacked off. His mother went to work every day, Harvey to school, and when he got there he started chores. One day when he was 14, he was doing chores as usual. He needed some rags, so he opened the dresser drawer where he had some things he didn't need anymore. While rummaging around, he came across a bundle of letters. Unfolding them, they were written in a language other than Russian, but there was a translation between the lines. Harvey read them and sobbed. What's this? His mother came home from work, sat down at the table, and his son threw the letters in there. Son, why did you get it, and how did you find it? His mother looked at him and quickly thought of what to say. It doesn't matter. Tell me how it happened. So Oliver is not my father. He had many questions. Honey, there was a war. I'm sorry about your mom, she cried. Tell me, he sat down on the chair across from her, ready to listen. I saved him. And again Betty had to tell the same story she had told her husband Oliver. Did she have to? He was a kid and he understood. Look, it's all happened. Why bring up the past? The woman didn't understand. I want to know why you wrote to him again. He nodded at the letters again. Listen, Harvey, it's an old and long story. Are you sure you want to know it all? The mother didn't know what to say to her son. Of course, it's my father. He poked at the letters again. Then, when Ivor left, I cried for a long time, more because I didn't understand what he was saying to me, not a word at all. A tear rolled down Betty's cheek. So, what? I've heard that before. Was the young man irritated? I didn't need anything. I didn't know you existed yet either. Nothing was nice. And when a few days passed, a little calmed down, sat down at the table, poured a mug of water, wanted to drink, and saw on the tree a knife cut out some numbers and letters. Honestly, at first I didn't pay attention to it, but at night, 
When I went to bed, it hit me. It was the address, and no one but him could have left it there. My mother told me emotionally, as if she had gone back there, a few years ago. And you wrote to him, the boy concluded. No, but I realized that he didn't just leave it there. She tilted her head, ashamed in front of the most beloved person on earth. So, when did you send your first letter? Harvey had no patience. When I heard about you, raised her mother's eyes to him. And him? Asked the boy, and then he grinned. He's read everything today. Yes, I wrote to him that I was expecting a child alone. I do not know how he read my letter. But from him came a reply, in which I did not understand anything. And when the time passed, I went to the school, to the German teacher, and she translated it for me, sighed Betty. He didn't want to know you. Harvey quoted a line from the letter. You know, Clava translated it verbatim. Maybe it didn't say that. And again a tear left a wet trail on her cheek. And then he asked you to come over, and Harvey pulled one of the letters out of the pile. Yes, but how could I? Because I was already with Oliver, and it all came to an end, she said sadly. Mom, how could you? While our soldiers were fighting them, you. He didn't finish, though it was clear. I'm sorry, son. She stood up, came over, wanted to hug him, but the boy shrugged. We've been told all our lives that this is the enemy, that we won, and now I find out that you. With this, he was ready to cry, but restrained himself. After this conversation, the boy did not talk to his mother for the rest of the school year. And after that he silently packed his suitcase and went to live in the city. Son, she looked at him as he left, and she remembered the moment when Ivo left the same way. Goodbye, Harvey didn't even turn around. The young man arrived, got a job. Now he was studying and working at the same time. Sometimes the lad thought of his mother, but always pushed those thoughts aside. Harvey knew what he wanted, but he never achieved anything. When he was already in his thirties, he met a woman. They decided everything quickly, and now they were standing in the registry office. Why aren't any of your relatives here? Ariana asked him then. I have only my mother, but she couldn't come. The guy lied. He still hadn't communicated with the woman, though she had made more than one attempt. Understandably, Ariana felt bad that this was the case, after all, she too only had a father who was sick and couldn't. What's wrong with you, all these people? He pointed at his friends. It's okay, the bride told him then. Not even a few months after the wedding, she got pregnant. Harvey wasn't exactly happy. He kept muttering to himself about age. Where to have a baby, soon to retire, that the child old people will take to kindergarten or school, he said then. Enough and older people give birth, his wife refuted his opinion. In the other in the family, everything was fine. Pregnancy, strangely enough, went well. The boy Mickey was born exactly on time, and as soon as the father saw him, he was ready to take back all the words he had said before. Son, when you grow up, I'll tell you so much and show you so much, the father sat by the crib. At this moment, he was thinking more and more about his mother how she was alone there, what she was doing. Now that he had a child of his own, he realized how much he had hurt her then. And mom, what had she done wrong to him, giving birth? Harvey had made up his mind, as soon as Mickey was old enough, he would definitely go to his mom's house. What's the matter, Betty? You're still alone. A neighbor came to see her. I'm very guilty before my son, and he can't forgive me. He holds a grudge for life, she said tearfully. Write to him, the woman advised. I wrote, it doesn't help. The letters just come back, she pointed to the dresser, where there were a dozen envelopes. That's where the grief is, sighed her friend. And so they sat for many evenings until, one day, the door opened and Harvey appeared on the doorstep. Son, Betty jumped to her feet. She recognized him. He smiled and hugged the woman. What are you doing here? She couldn't stop crying. Let's at least sit down at the table. He looked at the neighbor. Okay, goodbye. I'm going, 
she got up and left the house. Betty was in the house making tea, putting everything on the table. Harvey, how can it be? After all these years, without warning, she wailed. Mother, I've come to apologize. He bowed his head. What are you saying? It's my fault. I'm the one who should apologize. She hugged him and kissed him again and again. And I got married. He showed the ring on his finger. Congratulations, she started cutting pies. And now you have a grandson, Mickey. The man smiled. Oh, what a joy. She splashed her hands. They sat at the table talking for a long time. And when it was late, Harvey went to the place where his corner used to be. Shall I stay with you and talk some more? He asked Betty. What do you ask? You can move in. She was always glad to have them. When the beds were made, the son sat down on his mother's bed. What are you what? She stroked his hair as in childhood. In fact, I came not only to apologize, I want to know about my roots. Will you give me the address of this Ivo of yours? He lowered his eyes to the floor. Sure, but I doubt he still lives there, stood up and went to the chest of drawers. It's worth a try, her son answered her and took the envelope from her hands. They talked practically until morning, Harvey realizing how many years he had lost while he was angry with his mother. Now he was 100% sure he would never leave her alone again. In the morning, Harvey woke up, had breakfast. All right, I'm off. As soon as I know something, I'll let you know right away. The man hugged his mother. Good luck, she crossed him on his way. After that, Harvey got into the car and drove to his home, where his wife and child were waiting for him. He decided not to say anything to anyone yet until he figured it out for himself why get people's hopes up? He drove and planned how and what would happen. Hello, he walked into the house, and as his son threw himself on his neck, he realized how his mother felt when he arrived. So, how was the meeting? His wife asked him. Great, now maybe we will have more relatives. He hugged her and whispered these words in her ear. What other relatives? She didn't understand. I don't say anything yet, he showed her the invisible key he used to close his mouth. Oh, all he has some secrets. Ariana kissed her husband on the cheek. When Harvey was at work the next day, he thought long and hard about whether or not to write to the address his mother had given him. He decided to, took out a piece of paper, and wrote the first two lines. Then he thought it was funny, crumpled the paper, and threw it in the bucket. Hello, Ivo. I don't know if you remember or not, but there was a girl in your life whose name was Betty. She wrote to you saying she was expecting a baby after you left. Well, that's me. My name's Harvey. I thought I'd find out about the roots I really have. I look forward to hearing from you. Sincerely, Harvey. He reread his lines once more, folded the sheet, sealed it in an envelope, and went to the post office to mail it. Why do you keep rattling them? His wife asked him when he checked the mailbox several times each day. I'm waiting for an important letter, he told her. Well, she said nothing, only sighed. It had been a long wait, four years, and Harvey had given up hope that an answer might come. But strangely enough, it did. The man came from work, automatically, as he had done for many days, months and years, opened the drawer, waiting for nothing, and there was happiness an envelope. Ariana, he answered. He came home dancing. Who is he? She still didn't know what her husband was hiding. I'll tell you. He went into the kitchen to read it. To Harvey's great regret, the letter was in German as it had been in the past and it would be impossible to read it today. He put it in his jacket pocket and decided that tomorrow he would go to the teacher, as his mother had done. Well, his wife asked him when he came out of the kitchen. Nothing, he waved his hands. I see, another mystery. She sighed and went to the room where her son was already asleep. The man could not sleep all night. He was tossing from side to side. Different thoughts went into his head. What if it said that the addressee no longer lived at that address? Then he dismissed the thought. In the morning, he woke up not at all. I'm going to work. He said to his wife and son, 
then left the apartment. Bye, Ariana shouted as the door had already slammed shut. The man thought about where and who he should turn to. What if he went to the school, found the German teacher, and just showed the letter? The man was somehow embarrassed about it. He came to work, took his seat. Why are you so glum? A colleague asked him. I need to translate the text from German, and I do not know who to turn to. Harvey did not hide from him. Let me see, he asked him. Do you know the language? He couldn't believe his luck. I can't say exactly what it says, but I can read it, he assured him. Here, he took out the envelope. So, let's see. The comrade began to run through the lines. Well, what is it? Harvey couldn't wait. Wait, aha, 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 continued to read. Oh, you don't understand anything. The colleague waved his hand at him and wanted to take the letter. Wait, what's your hurry? He stopped him. Tell me, what is it about? Harvey couldn't stand it. Look, Ivo is writing to you. He showed him the lines. I know that without you, Harvey was getting annoyed. He says he knows Betty and offers you a meeting in six months. He pointed to the name of the city. Wow, the man whistled. Who is it? Now there were questions from my colleague. I'll tell you later if I meet him. Harvey took the letter from him. In the evening, when he got home, told his wife that he would have a business trip to the capital in a few months. She only smiled, probably already realized that her husband was looking for someone. But since he did not speak, she also kept silent. Are you sure you need this meeting? Ariana asked him. Absolutely, he answered first and then stared at her, but didn't say anything. Okay, I won't interfere. She stepped back into the kitchen. The whole time Harvey was walking around not himself. He didn't know what he was going to talk to this man about, what he would say to him, or how they would even communicate. He was worried. Finally, the time for the meeting came. All right, wish me luck, Harvey said to Ariana. Good luck, and that everything works out, she whispered in his ear and kissed him on the cheek. It was Harvey's first time on an airplane, it was unusual, he made a wish. Landing at the airport, he drove to the hotel that was listed in the letter. He checked into the room, now wondering how they would meet. In the evening, there was a knock on the room door. Harvey opened it. Good afternoon, stood a man who spoke with a heavy accent. Hello, nodded Harvey. You speak our language, Harvey exhaled with relief. My name is Kloss, I am Ivo's son. You wanted to meet us. He extended his hand to greet and introduce himself. You speak our language, Harvey exhaled in relief. Yes, he was smiling with all his 32 teeth. Shall we go out, or are you coming to my place? The landlord asked. Yes, to the restaurant, my father is already there, waiting for us, he said. He spoke so fast that even in Russian Harvey could hardly understand him. I'll be right down, he promised. When the door closed, Harvey began to pace around the room. He didn't know why he was so agitated. In the end, he did nothing, combed his hair, and went out into the hallway. A man was walking down it, and his hands and feet were shaking. Greetings, he walked over to the table where Kloss and another man were sitting. Ivo, the man stood up and shook his hand. Nice to meet you, he looked at him. You know, this may sound funny, but my father didn't want to come here. He was scared, Claus said. He was still sitting with a strained smile. That's the way it is now. Harvey was out of sorts. They started talking, Claus acting as translator. I knew you existed a long time ago, Harvey admitted. Yes, my father says he did, too, Claus nodded. So many years lost, the man said bitterly. Dad didn't believe it at first, but when Betty wrote several letters, he decided she couldn't write the same thing in each one. The son looked at his father. Exactly, sipped Harvey's water. Ivo wants to meet up again with Beatty, fell silent his son. Okay, but we'll have to go, he added gesturing, because he thought he wasn't being understood. If we are already here, we are ready for anything, translated again the man's words close. 
when do we leave? Harvey imagined how happy his mother would be to see this man after all these years. Tomorrow, the guest of the capital called the waiter. They ordered something to eat and talked a lot. Then Ivo went to his room and Klaus and Harvey went to his. Our parents had a lot of fun, said the foreign friend and maybe a brother on the way. Yeah, how long have you known about this? Harvey was curious. No, after your letter came, it went to my father's old address, but we were tracked down. That's why it took so long to get a reply, Klaus explained. Now I see, they entered the room. The men talked for a long time about who lived where and how. It turned out that Claw's mother had passed away for several years due to illness. He has two other sisters and a brother, nephews, a large family. And if everything is confirmed, then we are definitely waiting for all of you to visit. The man glowed with happiness. When it was already late, the men separated, and in the morning they got on the plane again and flew to visit Betty in a distant village. Worried, Harvey leaned over to Ivo. No, he answered sharply. Don't mind him, he's just worried, his son explained. Well, I'm scared of flying too, Harvey agreed with him. That's not why he's scared, it's because he's meeting someone he knew in the worst years of his life, Klaus said quietly. They had landed, now there was a bus ride to be had, but that didn't scare anyone. The guests looked around in wonder, they were interested in everything. That's it, only a few kilometers left and we'll be at my mother's house. The man could not speak with excitement. They got there and then they walked for a while. When they approached the house, Harvey was ahead of them and put his finger to his lips. Mom, I have a surprise for you. He entered the house. The woman was sitting with a neighbor as usual. What? She got up. Let's go, called her son. They went out on the porch, one look, and she recognized him, cried. Betty, Ivo said. Her husband warned her not to say anything to anyone. He didn't want anyone to know and judge his family. Time passed, and Harvey couldn't get up the nerve to visit his relatives. Why are you stalling? It's been two years since we met. Honestly, I don't know. He threw up his hands. That's it. Write a vacation request at work, and we're going. Ariana had never been abroad, she really wanted to. Mickey was 10 years old at the time when his parents finally packed up. They decided that the boy would still have time to go, so they took him to his grandmother's house. Are you sure you've made up your mind? Betty asked them. Of course, we already have the call, smiled Ariana. Then have a good flight. She hugged first her daughter-in-law, then her son. And they went. It was interesting, mesmerizing. When they were in Germany, Ariana couldn't get enough of it. It wasn't like this. I wish I could move here to live, she said dreamily. What problems? Her relatives couldn't understand. It's decided. Now we'll go back, get Barry, and if possible, come here, the woman said. Harvey thought, why did he procrastinate with this acquaintance for so many years? Now long ago all his dreams would have been accomplished. After they walked through the beautiful streets of the small town, walking home, where everything was also beautiful. I can't believe I have to fly away from here, Ariana said. We'll definitely come back. Klaus and Harvey shook hands. They got on the plane reluctantly, a force pulling them back. Goodbye, Ariana whispered as she looked out the window, but the date was not to be. As the plane gained altitude, something happened to the engine a major airplane crash. Betty and her grandson were baking pies, and at one point her heart gave such a pang that she even sat down on a chair. Grandma, what's wrong? Mickey came over to her. It's all right, honey. She looked at the boy. And then they were told the terrible news. It can't be. The woman couldn't believe it. She realized Mickey had been orphaned. It happens, shook her head, a specialist from some services. The happy and carefree life of the boy ended there. Three years later, his grandmother felt ill. She called an ambulance, and while the car was on its way, she called her grandson to her. Take this, she gave him an envelope in her hand. 
What is it? He didn't understand. It's your grandfather's address in Germany. If it's too bad, right there and everything will be fine, she told him. Mickey took the envelope, but he thought his grandmother was just delirious because she was sick. And then she didn't come back, and strange people came for Mickey and took him to an orphanage. No good things were to be expected at this institution. The most important thing is that the boy got a best friend there, with whom he then became friends for a very long time, you could say, until his death. Nanny, they were already working together, and Mickey approached him. What do you want? He was in a bad mood, as usual. Can I use your services? He asked. Sure, the friend grinned. I don't know if it's true or not, but if something happens to me, can you give this envelope to my wife? He handed him an old envelope. Sure, what's in it? A million. Nanny was smiling again. I don't know, maybe more, shrugged Mickey. It was six months before the accident the man had been in. And now this envelope was in the hands of Maddie, who didn't understand anything. What is this? asked Catherine when she saw the yellow old envelope. I don't know. The woman shrugged her shoulders. She herself was curious. You and Daddy did not hide anything from each other. Why he did not tell about it, did not understand the girl. Let's better see, then all the questions will immediately disappear, offered Madi. Okay. They went to the table and opened what they had just been handed. Look, there's something written here. Catherine showed her mom. Yes, she started to read the story first, and when she got to the end, she cried a couple times. Let's write, looked at her mom. Do you think it's convenient? Maddie doubted. And what's the big deal? It says here, if something bad happens, then be sure to write, showed her the girl. So how many years ago it was, the woman twirled the envelope in her hands. So, what? Will it hurt us if we do it? Her daughter didn't understand. Okay, we'll decide tomorrow. She put it all back together and went about her usual business. In the evening, Maddie got a call from Natalie, a friend who always supported her in everything. Hi, can you come over? She asked her. Of course, lately Natalie had been concerned at all about what was going on in Maddie's family. They met that evening and her friend showed her around and told her everything. And you still think, right, Catherine says, right, and that's it. No, so no. She looked at Maddie with big eyes. All right, the woman decided. At night, when Natalie had left and Catherine had gone to bed, she wrote a letter saying that Mickey had died and all that. The next day, she sent it off, though it was funny. Hardly anyone wrote letters like that anymore. The reply came six months later. Mommy, we have a letter. Catherine walked into the house. Maddie took the envelope, unfolded it. It said that they were expected, and the address where they should fly. It can't be. Maddie remembered the words of the woman from the park, that she should talk to the father, and everything would be all right at once. It was scary, but there was nothing to lose. The woman packed the children, the documents were ready, and now they were on their way to a distant, unknown country. At the airport they were met by strangers, an elderly man. Guten Tag. Maddie had learned it on purpose. Hello, I'm Klaus, he told her. Oh, you speak Russian. She was taken aback. Let's go. He brought her to his house. Klaus's wife was there, as well as his children and, as Maddie realized, grandchildren. I'm kind of uncomfortable, the woman said as she was seated at the table. It's okay. If it wasn't for your grandmother, none of us would be here, Claus said with a smile. They started reminiscing about that story again, showing pictures of my grandfather and father. Wow, I didn't know anything about that, Maidie said. Your family is so uncommunicative. First the son took years to write to us, and then the grandson, the man smiled. There can't be any questions for me. I only found out after my husband died, Maidie sighed. No, we're not telling you anything. We'd like to see everyone. We've only seen Mickey on the photo, and even then small, said the owner of the house. The children are very happy here, 
Their mother hasn't seen them at all since they entered the house. Don't worry, they are looked after, Claus said. Maddie was offered to stay here. She had to find a job and of course learn the language. The woman said she would try and it all worked out quickly, but she knew she would do her best and everything would work out. One day she was walking in the park, which was in the backyard of her house, and a man came up to her. Hi, he said to her with an accent. Guten Tag, she said, a word she had known for a long time. Bruno, he extended his hand to her. Maddy, she nodded, thinking the family had some guests. Oh, you've already met my son, Klaus told the woman. Wow, she laughed. From that moment on, the man never left her side. He invited her for walks, took her to different places, and then he asked her out on a date. How is that possible? She didn't understand. Your children are related to us, but you're not, he said, smiling. Well, yes, she stretched out. After one date, there was a second, and then another, and another. Will you marry me? Bruno handed her the ring one night. Jesus, Maddie clutched her cheeks, which were flaming. The poor widow had no idea her life would change so drastically. Just yesterday, she was walking around begging for alms, and now she's in another country and they're making her an offer. Accept it, Klaus nodded. Yes, she said, but what about my children? Your children will be mine because they have our blood in them, he was sure of it. What a man you are, she hugged the man. In the evening, the whole family celebrated the event. The wedding was in the near future. Everyone was very happy, especially the bride and groom. Who would have known that the secret that was in the family of her late husband Barry will give such a result, she later said more than once to her husband. I love you, he answered her. Mommy, and you didn't want to write a letter, Catherine told her, who also liked everything here. Thank you, sweetheart. She stroked her head. Bruno and Maddie moved into a separate house. Now they had a shared household. The woman cooked dishes that were unknown to the man, but he liked them so much he couldn't refuse them. Will you bear me another child? He asked her constantly. Yes, now already Maddie did not doubt anything the way she did before. I am the happiest man in the world, he shouted then. And indeed, it was only a few months after the wedding when Maidie announced that they were about to have a little one. Now she remembered finding out about her past pregnancies and thought that this was actually bliss. She'd thought differently before. How are you feeling? Her husband asked her a hundred times a day because he was very worried. Catherine, who was already quite an adult, was also happy for her mother. The younger ones also touched her belly and smiled. So, who do you think we're having? The whole family was together again. Maddie loved it so much, before they were just by themselves, and now there were so many people. A boy, shouted Bruno first. Why not a girl? Catherine asked. She wouldn't mind having another baby girl. We'll find out soon, Klaus reassured them, and they started dinner. Maddie already knew her body, so she asked to be taken to the hospital a little early. Everyone was surprised at that, but agreed. Now she was lying in the clinic, and she imagined what would happen. As usual, it was very painful, but the local doctors put some kind of injection, a little released. Maddie was glad of that. A sturdy little boy was born. The woman didn't want to name him herself, because she thought the family might have its own traditions. I didn't give him a name, waiting for you, she told the many relatives when they came to see her. He will be called Mickey, her husband told her. What are you doing? She was stunned. Let us have a piece of my brother, the man said. Okay, then promise me that when Barry turns two or three, we'll fly to everyone's graves, she asked him. I promise, he loved her dearly. When the family came home, they had aunts, uncles, grandmothers, and grandfathers visiting them every day. Everyone brought gifts and wanted to hang out. Why didn't I have all this before? Maddie laughed often. Now that everyone was involved, she didn't even have to do anything. Everyone knew what and when and what time. 
Is it really like that? She asked her husband, and at that moment she remembered asking Mickey the same question, only on a different occasion. Yes, she loved Bruno, but there was more respect in their family than the reverent feelings between her and Mickey. Are you ready to travel? Her husband asked her two years after Mickey was born. Of course, she looked up to him, a man who, if he made a promise, was sure to keep it. Would you take me with you? I want to visit my brother's grave, Klaus asked them. Who would mind? The family laughed, and a few other relatives gathered with them. When they were at the airport, it seemed that only their family was there. Catherine and the boys were running around the small outlets that were there. Mickey was crying in his mother's arms. He was scared of it all. Finally, everyone boarded the plane and flew. Maddie looked out the window. She knew it would only be a few days and they would be here again. Well, hello, motherland. She stepped off the plane. You kiss the asphalt, her daughter said. Why? If I have to, I'll kiss it, smiled her mother in response. First, they drove to the village where the grave of Grandma Betty, her son Harvey and his wife Ariana was. Hello, brother, Claus said, and put down the flowers. Yeah, Betty made a mess, said Maddie. After that, they went to the town where Mickey and Maddie lived, and there they came to his grave to visit him. Hello, my darling, said Maddie, looking up at the picture. We look a bit alike, Bruno told her. Maybe I chose you for a reason, she turned to him and smiled. Look, brother, we have a piece of you now, he led her to the grave. That's enough, Maddie couldn't hold back her tears. She asked for everyone to leave and let her talk to her ex-husband alone. I hope you don't hold it against me for being with Bruno right now. He's a really good man, and he's supportive of all of us. I think you're just glad you did, wailed Maddie at the graveside. Where to now? Everyone asked the woman. Now we're going to the temple where I think I've been heard and helped. She said the address and everyone went there. Wow, it's beautiful, the relatives said when they got out of the car. Yes, and that's where I was, after which they brought me your envelope, she confessed to them. Everyone crossed in front of the entrance, went in, bought candles. Maddie went straight to the priest. Hello, do you remember me? She approached the man. Of course, how could I not remember? You never came then, he smiled into his beard. There have been such changes in my life that it is impossible to believe in them. And how not to believe in miracles? She cried again. Don't. He crossed her as he had then, turned and left. The family stayed here for a few days, and then they had to fly back. And now Maddie did not know when she would return to her homeland again. Thank you for watching this video to the end. Subscribe to the channel. Like it, write comments if you like the story, and see you on the channel.